Good uh, morning, everyone. I'm really happy to see a full room here today. So welcome to this event. And a special welcome to Mr. Ambassador Renneberg and uh, Professor Neumann. We also have uh, Dr. Moe and Shedimu from Norway, who will speak to you in the second panel, as well as Pavlina Yenebova, who is also here in the audience already. Uh, welcome to this event, uh, European Diplomacy Amidst Russia's War in Ukraine, Preserving European Values. We will focus on the response of the European Union to Russia's war in Ukraine. During the second panel, we will approach the issue through Martin Supko's perspective, focusing on the coherence of uh, the European Union's response uh, to the war. Uh, it is a war which very much is a defining moment also for the European Union. We are today actually in a situation where we are discussing in a realistic way the possibility of the European Union having 36 member states by 2030. I'm not saying that that will happen, but even having a serious debate about this issue is something which would have been unthinkable two years ago. Uh, so this is something we, we might get back to as well during uh, the second part of, of today's conference. We will, however, start by focusing a little bit on Norway. Norway is, of course, an interesting country in this perspective, given that it is a country which is not a member of the European Union, even if it collaborates very closely within the European economic area, within the Schengen area, and opting in sometimes on the European Union's common foreign and security policy. And of course, I guess the perspective might also be different from the perspective of Norway as a big exporter of energy, oil and gas. I will not speak any more about this. I will allow Mr. Ambassador, Victor Renneberg, to do so. Welcome here. I would just like to say a big thank you, first of all, both to the uh, European Economic Area and Norway grants for financing this event and to the Norwegian Embassy here in Prague for supporting this event as well. Mr. Ambassador, Your Excellency, I will give you the microphone. Sure. Please. Do you want to stand or? No. Well, dear directors, dear experts, dear students, it's a great pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to see that so many of you are interested in this theme. Um, Norway and Czech Republic, we have much in common. Our trade is substantial. Norway is providing uh, Czechia with uh, salmon, uh, natural gas, and Czechia is providing Norway with uh, Skodas and computers. Every week we have about 1,000 Norwegians coming here to the Czech Republic, most of them in Prague, and they are visiting your fantastic cities and seeing your uh, many cultural attractions. At the same time, we have uh, numerous Czechs that are hiking in the Norwegian mountains. They are rafting in our rivers and they are enjoying the midnight sun or during the winter rather than northern light. Also, where political bonds are, are close, we share the very same values. We are allies in NATO, and partners in Europe. Uh, we are both dependent on the rule-based international order. And that order is now under attack. It's under attack, not least from Russia. Russia wants a new European architecture where military might ranks higher than international law. Because of this, both of the countries are doing what we can to help Ukraine win this war. We are helping Ukraine by, by providing military and economic assistance. We are helping Ukraine by imposing heavy sanctions on Russia. We are helping Ukraine by receiving in Ukrainian refugees. And here I would like to thank Czech, 
Czechia, and I'm really impressed by all what you are doing, taking so many Ukrainian refugees, hosting them in your, your country. But we're also helping Ukraine through diplomatic means. Here in Europe, by striving to keep a unified European response with regard to practical existence, as well as preparing for closer European integration into European and transatlantic structures. And additionally, we are helping Ukraine by try, trying to con convince countries in different parts of the world that Russia's invasion represents a blatant breach of international law and is also a threat to their interest and they should therefore have a strong interest in supporting our common cause. When time is right, diplomatic dialogue between Ukraine and Russia will be resumed. When Ukraine is ready for such a dialogue, we are prepared to support them in what way, whatever way we can. I'm very pleased that Norway, through the EEA grants, has been given the opportunity to support this very timely conference on the role of Norwegian and European diplomacy amidst Russia's war in Ukraine. A special thanks goes to the Metropolitan University Prague and its partner in Norway, the Fritjof Nonsense Institute, represented here by quite a few people, not least the director, Ivor Neumann, who is a specialist in Russian-European relations and also a former colleague of mine in the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So I wish you all a successful conference. Thank you. Thank you very much, and Mr. Ambassador. I will give a word to Mr. Director, Professor Ivan Neumann. I just want to say once more a thank you to the Fritjof Nansen Institute, or Partner Institute, uh, for this event and within this project. Thank you very much. And I would like to just introduce uh, Professor Neumann here by saying that he is one of the leading international relations experts, and with a special focus on Russian foreign policy, diplomacy, discourse analysis, and many other things. Welcome, Ivar. Happy to have you here. Thank you so very much, Mats, and, and it's good to be here. Uh, I was drinking beer here as a young man, and I'm now drinking beer here as an old man, and uh, it's both equally pleasing. So uh, it's always a good place to visit. Um, I was thinking, given the uh, parameters of the, of the seminar, uh, that uh, it might be a good idea to have a look at Norway's relations with Russia, because as seen from Czechia and as seen from Central Europe, and in some measure also from Eastern Europe, uh, it's impossible to gauge Russian foreign policy without taking into consideration the uh, experience from 1947 to 1991. Norway did not have that experience, uh, Norway uh, was uh, a NATO country uh, during the Cold War, uh, that, but we have a border with Russia and we've had an experience with Russia that primes us to see the conflict from a slightly different angle. So where there are different historical memories, uh, there are different perspectives. Uh, if you're a Transylvanian of some stripe, the world will look like one kind of kettle of fish. If you're from another stripe, it will look quite differently. So I thought, uh, despite the risk of talking about uh, one's own country, which can be quite tedious for somebody else, that this might have some interest. So the first lesson uh, from, for Norwegian foreign policy after the Second World War was that uh, Norway's and Denmark's neutrality had been encroached by Nazi Germany. And uh, our reaction to that was to seek NATO membership after the Second World War. Sweden, on the other hand, had maintained its neutrality and, lo and behold, stayed neutral after the Second World War. This is what a political scientist would call path dependency. Uh, Norway was such, in, the, in, in this sense, a staunch member of the Western Bloc, or the Aggressivny Bloc, as the Russian would say, right? Uh, but Norway, also had a peculiarity. Uh, in 62 and 67, and then again in 72, uh, there were discussions about whether to join the European Union. 
And uh, the whole thing came off a bit at a, right, at a strange slant because we followed Britain. That's why nothing came to fruition in 62 and 67. But in 72, there was a referendum. And for the first time in world history, uh, a nation said no to the offer of membership in the what was then the European community. And Norway then did it again in 1994 after the end of the Cold War, where the idea was that uh, there would be a new deal, as it were, uh, and Norway would join. The Norwegian people's majority, the majority of the people casting the vote, I think it was something like 51.3%, so it was touch and go, said no. So Norway didn't join. What we instead got was what uh, the ambassador noted as the European Economic Area, which is a rather dynamic setup. It begins with the uh, economy, but different stuff pops up all the time. Over the last couple of years, for example, uh, the question of ACER, the question of how to regulate energy markets in Europe, in, uh, particularly uh, our electri electricity markets, has become rather important. So. The Brits say in for a penny, in for a pound, the European Economic Area, the EEA, opens for a, sort of an ever closer integration, just like EU uh, membership itself does, uh, an ever greater integration between the peoples of Europe. Okay? Uh, so Norway is in, but also out. Uh, the, what has to be remembered, though, when it comes to the Norway's relationship to Russia, is that uh, there are certain peculiarities there as well. There were, in this country, Russia famously didn't pull out when the, Soviet, when the Second World War was over, but there were two places, and only two, in Europe where the Red Army did pull out. And those two were Bornholm, a Danish uh, island in the, uh, in the uh, Baltic Sea, and Eastern Finnmark, that is the uh, very northeastern sort of swathe of Norway. And this has not been forgotten, particularly not in the north of the country, that, uh, that Soviet soldiers were liberators who came and chased out the Nazis. And uh, particularly given the fact that the Nazis used the so-called Sweden Earth tactics, they burnt everything and then retreated. Of course, the uh, incoming Soviet um, uh, force was an extremely welcome addition to life in the high north. And this has been sort of remembered to this day, and this is also during the Cold War, was sort of an important thing that one could have so-called memory diplomacy. One could reconcile and say that, okay, we have our differences now, there's a Cold War between systems, but we fought Nazi Germany together, and then one would put sort of uh, the, um, the sort of uh, accoutrements that go with this kind of thing on graves. And this would happen all over Norway and sort of in, in would be a big thing both in the capital but also in northern Norway. Uh, this kind of, this is a tie that binds, you know. Uh, so there was a sort of groundswell of sympathy for the Soviets in the uh, north. One should also note that during the Cold War, Norway saw uh, need not only to deter Russia as a member of NATO, but also to reassure Russia. So we did this in three principal ways. We pledged not to harbor nukes on Norwegian soil, and particularly given that Murmansk has its uh, sort of an important part of its second strike capability, the capability to hit back in, takes in case of a nuclear attack in Murmansk, uh, it was deeply appreciated that Norway didn't harbor nukes on its territory. Uh, Norway also unilaterally pledged not to, uh, to harbor bases from other NATO countries in Norway. And uh, we also stayed away from conducting maneuvers in eastern Norway on the Russian border. So there was this idea that one should deter Russia, but one should also uh, reassure Russia. And uh, this also sort of actually led to, and this, now I'm beginning to speak directly to today's situation, this also led to rather far-flung cooperation in the north. Um, we, I will mention two things specifically. Uh, in the uh, Arctic, in the high north, there's an archipelago of islands 
called Svalbard, the largest of which ones uh, of the islands is called Spitsbergen. And uh, there would be Norwegian and Russian presences in this place. There would also be international presences. Uh, there would be researchers and there would be a certain commercial uh, uh, activity, sort of call. When people are sort of scattered around a large island in an Arctic climate, things may go wrong, and if they go wrong, it may go very wrong. So search and rescue, mutual aid in such a situation is very important. So throughout the Cold War and throughout the after, war, after sort of Cold War period, the 30 years since the Cold War, this has been a live concern, how to set up this, how to conduct Norwegian sovereignty in, should we say, cooperation with Russians in, uh, in the Svalbard archipelago. And it has sort of worked quite well. Uh, one should also note, and this I think is of the essence, um, that in 74, 75, uh, Russian and Norwegian fishery experts came together because there were worries on both sides uh, that the stock of fish would actually be depleted if one didn't cooperate about, their, about sustaining them. And uh, fish is an important uh, protein source both for Russians and for Norwegians. And uh, we've had plenty of cases around the world of fish simply disappearing. So two basic protocols were drawn up, and uh, here comes the rub. Every year, people have met on the bureaucratic level from the respective fisheries ministries in the two countries and also ex civilian experts, as it were, to renew these, these, uh, these protocols. And this has gone on to this day. And there's been a small but intense debate in Norway about this. And this is a parallel to a number of other countries. You can be an enemy of a country, but you will still have a need to talk to that country in order to sort of clear away misunderstandings and in order to, to take care of mutual interests, in this case, uh, sustaining fishing, fishing stocks. And this is particularly important during climate changes like the ones we have now, where Arctic waters become warmer and the fish will then follow the sort of kind of habitat they are used to. They will like their waters to have the same temperature, uh, just like when some of us shave in the morning, the, the water should be sort of 39.2 per sort of degrees. It should not be 40 or, or 36, right? Uh, fish are pernickety in this way. They want the temperature right, so they will simply go north if the uh, waters are warmer. So it's pretty imperative that Norway and Russia take care of this together, and they have been able to do so. But in all these sort of things that I've been noticing, in all these sort of areas of cooperation, there have been problems. Take recent problems over the last two years, since the 24th of February, 2022 particularly. Consider the memory diplomacy of, of, uh, of, uh, of uh, of uh, meeting across the graves of the unknown soldiers. Right? Uh, there was a sort of incident, and totally unnecessary in my view, incidents in a Norwegian sort of town uh, in, the, uh, in the extreme north, uh, where there was sort of quarrels about who would actually put, lay down the wreath on the, on the grave, you know. Should there be a wreath from the Soviet, from the Russian side first, or should it be from the Norwegian side first? And then members of the public would start moving these wreaths around. And you know, is this, this is no way to treat the dead. They're supposed to be quiet around the dead, right? Uh, they're lying perfectly still, you know, why make, make trouble? And uh, so this followed a long history of skirmishes where Russia would use these sort of uh, occasions of memory di diplomacy with Norwegians in Norway in order to draw lines between the fight against Nazis during the Second World War and Russia's present aggressive war in Ukraine. So, you know, Russian ways of dealing with this have made it very hard to sustain the sort of relations that, uh, that have been fairly smooth when it comes to the dead over 70 years. So in this case, it's, uh, Norwegian-Russian relations are actually worse than they were during the Cold War. Take, um, Cooperation on fisheries, 
we have been able to, uh, to do that in common, but last year the protocol had a little sort of, sort of footnote to it, and those of you who know things about international protocols know that footnotes and brackets are not good news, right? And sure enough, Russia insists, Russia insists that if Norway closes one of the three fisheries harbors that are still open to Russian ships, the uh, sort of protocol will no longer, the agreement will no longer hold. So again, deterioration. Uh, when it comes to, uh, to uh, living together in the open seas, uh, in the border area between Russia and Norway, once again, we see problems. We've had cases of, of uh, Russian uh, ships, uh, sort of seemingly civilian ships, but in actual fact, spying ships, hunting Norwegian uh, research vessels and harassing them. So we see a new development on sea that looks very much like what has been going on in the air, you know, at the num along a number of, 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 of air boundaries in this world, uh, there will be jet planes coming up and do, to do an interdiction right before the sovereign territory of a state. So in this case, Russia will try, will test the metal of Norway by flying in and then the Norwegian jet would come on the wings and interdict it, right? And now sort of this kind of thing has started at sea as well, which is very inconvenient. So the, and uh, the idea is for Russia to demonstrate that they can they can harass Norwegian ships if they want to. And uh, it's not particularly constructive. Um, so this makes for a problem. Um, our chair mentioned oil and gas, but we have uh, one of Norway's top experts on Norwegian oil and gas uh, in the next panel. So I will stay clear of that topic uh, and leave it to those who actually know what they're talking about. Always a good idea. Um, I thought I would end by answer, answering a question asked by, uh, by our host. Is the Norwegian resolve, is the Norwegian metal uh, in, in helping Ukraine deteriorating? And uh, my answer would be a firm no for the time being. Norway took all of one day to decide to, uh, to follow the EU line on help and, and an EU and NATO line and on helping uh, Ukraine. One day is a long time in politics, but uh, you know, when you're not a member, you're not a member. You need at least a little time, right? And we've been uh, basically in the middle of the field when it comes to giving first humanitarian and then military aid to Ukraine. We've given proportionately. There's been a debate in Norway about how much we should give because people demonstrate that we get a windfall from increased uh, uh, <coughs> income from so the sale of oil and gas. And why shouldn't we give much, much more to Ukraine than what we've been given? But that has so far been a fringe debate. But I note it here because far from being a sort of a tapering off of, uh, of support, there's been talk about actually increasing the uh, the uh, the, um, the support. And uh, I open a parenthesis here to sort of share a small insight into Norwegian political culture. The program for humanitarian aid to, and partly also military aid actually, uh, from Norway to uh, Ukraine is called the Nansen Help. And the reason for that is that Fritjof Nansen uh, was the first high commissioner for, for refugees in the League of Nations. And he did a lot of work uh, uh, before, a, no, actually at the beginning of that period in southern Ukraine in order to alleviate the hunger catastrophe in those years. And when the foreign ministry decided to, 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 to play with the idea of calling this the Nansen Help, I, as the director of the Pritchard Nansen Institute, received a telephone sort of informing me about this and actually even asking if this was okay. And there's no legal reason to do this whatsoever. It just demonstrates that Norway it's a consensus culture, and if you can be caught, caught cautious, uh, if you can be cautious, why not do it? So I thought that was an interesting little insight into how Norwegian politics works. You know, um, being nice—I mean, as the Brits say, it's nice to be nice, right? And that's also a Norwegian principle, most of the time, at least. But if we look at what's coming, could the uh, support taper off? Of course, it could. 
there are those who see loss of life, and rightly, as an impetus to end wars. It goes for Gaza and it goes for, for, for Ukraine. I'm rather worried about the lack of consistency when it comes to Western support for Ukraine and the lack of support for Palestinians. Uh, a number of people think it's rather strange uh, that uh, Russia can, uh, can uh, operate as they please in occupied territory uh, and the West will sort of mobilize, whereas when Israel bombs uh, uh, thousands and thousands of, of men, women, and children uh, in an occupied territory, they get the U.S.'s support. This is the kind of thing that could undermine support for Ukraine uh, in the longer run, and it's, it's a terrible issue because everything that has to do with the Middle East and particularly with, uh, with the Israeli um, Palestinian uh, confrontation will, of course, immediately get a number of people up on their toe balls. Um, there is uh, a beginning debate, hasn't come that far yet, but there is a beginning, beginning debate about whether one should help migrants of fighting age. Is it correct that Norway should harbor migrants uh, who are between 20 and 45, 20 and 50, and in full battle order uh, when they are needed at the front? Should the Norwegian state then give a lot of, of money to the air war effort and at the same time harbor people who could have filled those fighting positions? This is a debate that is beginning to show itself as in the rest of Europe. It's also something that could undermine support. Uh, of course, there are a couple of things that hardly need mention. Um, general wear and tear, no breakthrough to the Black Sea, uh, the continuing problems with corruption in, in Ukraine, all this is very, very well known. And particularly the, what is probably the key factor here, which would be uh, the election of Donald Trump as the next president, the once and future president of the US. Um, Trump hadn't expected to be elected the last time. So when he was elected, he, uh, he was slow to take to the job. He spent the first two years not doing all that much. Uh, but this time, he's had two different teams working on how to hit the ground running and start stuff. And one of the things that, uh, that might kick in would be this whole question of, uh, of uh, NATO membership and Article 5. Uh, the idea was floated during the first Trump presidency of not actually using Article 5. You remember that Article 5 is the one that says that an attack on one is an attack on all. Not using that if member countries hadn't, uh, hadn't actually contributed more than 2% of the budget. Now that's a rather interesting way of running a military alliance. It means that you make the absolutely central factor dependent on an important but rather mundane question, namely money. It is not the way you build sort of uh, strong ties inside an alliance. This thing could come again. Uh, so that's the sort of the, that's going to be a cliffhanger. Um, so to sum up, Norway has a 196 kilometer long boundary with Russia, frontier with Russia in the uh, extreme north of, uh, of the country. Uh, we share a presence uh, with Russians in what is a part of the Kingdom of Norway but is regulated by a specific international treaty in Spitsbergen. Uh, we are traditionally rather steadfast as NATO members, but Norway does not have the experience of Czechoslovakia, Poland, the Baltic states particularly, so we are not among the major hawks of the present debate. So uh, we are definitely more steadfast than a country like Italy, but not so much as a country like Estonia. And uh, I suppose that's very much dovetailing with the broader traditions of Norwegian foreign policy. So I see no reason why that should change. Thank you so much.
it was turned off. No, I think you hear me a little bit better. Maybe you heard me all along. Uh, so I will repeat myself, but only briefly. Well, let's open up for questions, uh, both for Mr. Ambassador and for Professor Neumann. And I will start with one question using the privilege of being the moderator. And my question will go back to the theme of this particular panel, which is labeled two distinct paths when it comes to diplomacy against uh, Russia in the context of the war, uh, suggesting that the Norwegian path is different compared to the European Union, which I guess it's probably not. But my question goes in that direction, because as Professor Neumann mentioned, it took one day for Norway to agree to be a part of the first sanction packages. And if I'm correct, Norway has been a part of all the 11 sanction packages issued by the European Union so far, and there is a 12th on its way. And my question is going in this direction that for Norway, it has to be a little bit difficult to be a part of all this without being at the table, actually, while this is being negotiated. And in the early days of, of, uh, of uh, the war, of the, this phase, the full-scale phase of Russia's war in Ukraine starting in February last year, there was this discussion that you have the two other Nordic countries up there, Finland and Sweden, applying immediately for NATO membership. And Finland also entering, Sweden being about to do so. And there was a discussion, will this affect also Norway's uh, position in the Euro European Union, if there would be, I mean, Norway is in NATO, as has been mentioned here several times, and it's important to remember, but if it will change Norway's approach to the European Union. And that would be my first question. Do you think it's likely to happen, and do you think it's difficult for, the Europe, for Norway at this point not to be a part of all the discussions? <laughs> okay, I, I can start. Uh, as it was pointed out here, I mean, Norway is not a member of the European Union, but we are a member of the European Economic Area. And we are more economically integra integrated into the European Union than most European Union countries, about the same level as the Czech Republic. Uh, in addition to this EA agreement, we have about 50 other agreements, <coughs> where Schengen is the, maybe the most important, so we can travel among, between our countries without without passports. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the reason for that, as, 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 as Ivan Neumann pointed out here, I mean, it was very close. Uh, both, it was what, 53% no the first time and 51% no the second time. And you can ask, why would Norwegian vote no when Swedes and, Swedes and Finns and Austrians voted yes? We had the election at the same time. In fact, we put a Norwegian election a few days later to be sure that they had if they had yes, it would be yes in Norway too. I, I worked at the prime minister's office at that time. I was a bit involved in this. But anyway, we, uh, there was, uh, was a majority against. And of course, you can, uh, we have people here that know better than me why it was no, but what was fairly clear, it was in the rural areas. Along the coast, people were much more negative. And one of those reasons were the fish. I mean, I mean the, the, the Spanish, Portuguese, they have been fishing around Africa, different places. Uh, uh, they had lost some of their fishing grounds. They're looking for new fishing grounds. I think it's fair to say that the EU fishery policy wasn't really that advanced. We had a very good fishery policy and, 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 had, a, uh, and had, had fairly good control over fish stocks, also in, in working with Russia on that. Uh, and, uh, and, and they were afraid that they would lose access to the fish. That was one main reason. But I mean, remember, it's a very, very little, a very little percentage difference here. And also the fact that, that in Sweden, in northern Sweden, most people had moved to the central, to the cities, to the urban areas. In Norway, that was fairly well off. We had also subsidized living in all parts of Norway. And that's, of course, where there are mostly no people, uh, negative voters to the opinion was in those, those, uh, those part of, uh, of, 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 of Norway. And it's also fair to say that, uh, that even today there is a negative. I mean, there is not the majority for EU membership in Norway today. Clearly not. I and mean, I think that we have done quite well outside with the agreements we have had. But then coming back to your issue, I worked in the, in the Norwegian, Norwegian parliament for some time also. And there I learned that, you know, about at least half of all the laws or regulations that pass in Norway comes from the EU. And, and we are not at the table. We just have to accept it when it gets through the, uh, to Norway. We either accept it or we have to, to kind, of, kind of question the whole, the whole area of, of, of regulations that, that, that will then be, 
that will then be not applicable to, to, to the Norway. Uh, and, uh, and, 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 and the fact is that we are not sitting at a table. We are doing what we can to influence. Uh, of course, most of what is decided in the European Union is, is also we would vote for it anyway, uh, I think it's fair to say. But, but, but as a diplomat also here, I feel that when all my EU colleagues are having meetings, I'm not uh, in those meetings, and it's certainly, certainly, certainly uh, a, pos a position that, uh, that it would be easier for a diplomat uh, to be, uh, to be, uh, to be if Norway were in the European Union. Uh, but that's the way it is, and, and we also have over a bit more leverage, uh, I think it's fair to say, we have when we are not in the European Union, and you can see that also, for instance, on the, on the, on the, on the, on the discussions where this kind of dis division between national competences and EU competences, uh, when there are EU competences, of course, uh, there when, when Norway is out, outside the EU, we certainly have a voice that could be somewhat different. That's used quite a bit in the European, uh, in, in, in the UN, for instance, where the European, where the EU countries have their common statements, and, and we also can have then a somewhat different statement. And it happens also like in the Middle East and other places. So it's, a, it's a certainly a challenge, uh, but it's, a, it's also a few, few, a few advantages. As, and in Norway, is, as I said, doing quite well outside the, the European Union. There has been no really discussion about Norway joining the European Union uh, after the decision of Sweden and Finland to join NATO. And the reason for that is that there are still so much resistance among some of the parties that any, any of the larger parties have to cooperate with smaller parties. That's, that's very much against European Union membership. So I don't really see any changes there in the near future. But now we will hear from the expert on this matter. <laughs> I, uh, I, I agree with uh, His Excellency. Uh, and. Uh, I am both the right and the wrong person to answer the, ask this to, uh, to ask this question, because uh, uh, I spent two years campaigning for Norwegian EU membership uh, before the last referendum, and I am that most lonely of thing, a Euro Federalist in Norway. That is, I, I don't recommend it, ladies and gentlemen. Find yourself some other identities, but the EU question in, in Norway is paradoxical because uh, the more important the EU becomes for Norway politically and economically, the less we talk about it, which is quite strange. Uh, and uh, even a party that used to be the uh, sort of, we used to have two parties that would uh, sort of be able to carry the mantle of the state in Norway. It was the Labour Party and the Conservative Party. And the Labour Party was staunchly for EU membership in 1972. Uh, they had a left wing that left the party over it, but the rest of the party was very much in favor. Um, they were in favor in 1994, and now they hardly have any position. They, they, they are waffling on the issue. Uh, so the will to lead from the front simply isn't there, and uh, this fits a larger pattern where the present government does not really uh, lead by successes, if you like. Um, I will speculate about one thing, and I will take my cue from the question of Russia and its aggressive war. Uh, many of us thought that Russia would not at, sort of stage an all-out attack on Ukraine simply because we thought in terms of national interests. It was not in the interest of the country, it was not in the interest of the regime, it was not even in the interest of Putin himself. And then Russia did it anyway simply because irrational factors in international relations are so important. Seen from Russia, Russia has to be an empire and a great power, it, has, it can be nothing. And if you have that kind of approach to the world, then you will go to war in order to settle it. Uh, since our moderator is Swedish, I mean, we can hark back to 1905, when Norway and uh, Sweden were in a personal union under the Swedish king, and Norway wanted to, le to leave. And this would be the last remnant of a Swedish empire that had been in existence since the 1500s. So conservatives in, in Sweden thought that one should go to war against Norway in order to keep Norway inside for identity reasons. So this is not a new topic. And I mention it here because when it comes to Norwegian EU membership, uh, the ambassador mentioned fish as an important thing. But uh, I can't remember the exact figures now, but I think agriculture is 1% and fish is slightly less of the 
gross national income. So it's not that they're unimportant, they're very important, but it's not a huge thing. I mean, if you compare to Poland, for example, it's, it's not big. But identity-wise, this, as, as an ambassador also pointed out, this whole idea that regardless of where in Norway you live, you should have the same kind of setup. You should be equally well treated by the state, etc. And the uh, people against the EU point out, not wrongly, that uh, the EU is a pre-urban project, as it were. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's a modernizing project. It's not harking back to the countryside, it's looking forward to the cities. So there are reasons, you know, and, and uh, you know, one should always try to see the best arguments of the opponents. And if you live in a very, very obscure part of Norway, you have very good reasons to be against the EU simply because the EU is a factor of modernization. Uh, and uh, Norway could, for example, follow Sweden, who basically sort of built down the northern part of the country because it didn't pay to keep up the population there. Norway never did that for identity reasons. So these are the kinds of questions that one has to discuss in order to understand that. Just let me add there, you know, because uh, uh, Czechia is a much smaller country uh, than Norway, and, and you know, the distance from northern Norway to Oslo, where the decision is made, is it's actually, actually longer than from Oslo to Brussels. So if you live in a small village up north in Norway, you think it's very long to Oslo, where they decide important things for you, and you know, it's even further much further to Brussels. So it's really this kind of geographical aspect has also to be taken in, in, into account. Thank you both very much. I will ask one more question and then I will open up for the audience to, for you all to ask your questions. Uh, I would like to pick up on the final thing you mentioned, Eva, about the Norwegian position not being a hawk, but being quite steady. and. I was thinking, what if we look to the future and trying to speculate a little bit about potential solutions here? Assuming that, that Ukraine will be successful, let's assume that, that Ukraine managed actually to bring back Russian troops to the borders of 2014. What and what kind of order to establish to safeguard some security here in, for Ukraine? to avoid a recapitulation of the war again, what, what, what can be done? What, what, uh, that, that is a very difficult question, I understand that. And uh, we just have some speculation. And also, if there is a specific Norwegian position here, not being hawkish, but being steady, what would that be? And perhaps also linking to a broader issue that uh, when we speak, and you started speaking about both of you, the security environment is changing compared to what it was during the Cold War, also in the sense that you used to speak of the Nordic area as a specific Nordic balance. You had a low tension area during Cold War due to the fact that you had Finland with its specific partnership with the Soviet Union being neutral though, and you had Sweden being neutral, but with a non-official specific uh, relation to, to the West, of course, and this created a very no, non-tension environment, which is basically gone independent of what happens uh, after the, the war here. So the question is, what, what would be thinking here from a Norwegian perspective about broader order uh, uh, and uh, for the future? It's a huge question, sorry about that. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. Well, uh, as a small country, Norway has 5.4 million uh, uh, inhabitants, which is not a lot. And uh, as a middle economy, but a very open economy, the present day world order is very nice for Norway. Uh, we like it. Uh, we like it economically, because the free trade is very good for us. And we like it politically, because it's very simple. If you're a small country, the more of the uh, negotiations in the world that happen above board, that happen according to international law in the open, the more easy it is for a small country to play a role, the more policy that will, is being done in smoke-filled backrooms between the great powers themselves, the harder it is to be a small power. So everything that has to do with multilateral institutions, international law, 
transparency, prosperity. Norway loves it, not only because we're so nice, we are quite nice, but we're not that nice, uh, but also because it's in our self-interest. So Norway sort of spends quite sizable amounts every year on stuff like development aid, peace and reconciliation, disaster relief, etc. And we do that because it's what you know, an international relations scholar would call a raison de système. You know, we like the system and we want to oil it. So everything that does not work, work to the, to the uh, advantage of the system and would, would create disorder, we try to throw money on it so that it won't happen. Right? So everything, things go to hell. For example, when there's a sort of civil war in Somalia, uh, there will be disorder throughout the world. We have in Somali uh, uh, community in Norway of about 10,000 people. We have about the same when it comes to Eritreans, etc. But those are just sort of specific examples. We have the whole situation that every time something is off, the system doesn't deliver, and we don't like that because we want the system. So that would be, that would be the key thing. Um, uh, so being a good citizen for Norway is not only a question of, uh, of, of maintaining community for its own sake, it's also maintaining community where we can thrive. Uh, so this question of norms versus uh, interests as driving foreign policy, I think, is simply a suboptimal way of asking the question. Um, regardless of what happens, we have to live with Russians. Whether we have to live with Russia, I don't know, because there is a chance that Russia will ch change in very interesting ways as a result of this. But a key problem is that, uh, as seen from, Russia, from, from Norway and the West, we like transparent and clear-cut borders. Russia does not like transparent and clear-cut borders. Look at Transnistria, look at Georgia. Russia wants borders where there are sort of sizable amounts of turmoil so that they can turn up or down the conflict level. And uh, they are the ones who, dis to, who basically invented the idea of frozen conflicts. So I think the outcome of this war is going to be a frozen conflict. Uh, whether or not it will be uh, the boundaries of 2022 or 2014 um, or 2015, um, the, the results, I think, will be a frozen conflict. Um, a key problem for Norway, then, is that we want to, uh, to, to go on deterring and we want to go on reassuring. But we have a key problem. If you think like a military strategist and you look at a map, we don't have a map here, but Norway will be out towards the Atlantic, then there would be Sweden, then there would be Finland, and then there would be Russia. And with Sweden and Finland in NATO, Norway no longer needs to fear a military, direct military attack on southern Norway because we have what a strategist would call strategic depth to Russia which means that there's this military, solid military case for throwing everything we have in terms of military equipment to the north, towards the 996 kilometer boundary with, with Russia. And there may also be an expectation in NATO that Norway will concentrate on that because that's kind of our chunk of the boundary to Russia. If we do that, which we may, it will not exactly be a reassuring thing to do, as seen from the Russian point of view, because it will bring Norwegian military closer to this key basis in Murmansk. This debate is going to be very interesting. Uh, it's only just started. Uh, it's now sort of lurking around in military circles, but uh, it will break fairly quickly, and, uh, and it's going to be an interesting debate to follow, because it will poise uh, hawks such as they are, against doves such as they are, and they will test this question of whether Norway will remain as a balanced country in the middle. Thank you. Um, yeah, Ukraine. You know what has happened is that, that all countries, including the Czech Republic and Norway and others, we have kind of, we have kind of uh, uh, provided more and more military equipment and more and more far-reaching and, and heavy military equipment as the war has dragged on. Uh, now there seem to be a stalemate, uh, 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 and uh, 
it also seemed that unless they get much more weapons, much more modern weapons, uh, there seems to be likely to continue as a stalemate. Uh, we will then see after after the, the winter, where I fear a lot of a lot of Russian drones and rockets will try to to, to hit Ukraine, not least the energy infrastructure. But anyway, uh, if they were to, well, first first one you can ask, how can Ukraine regain that territory without hitting Russian territory itself? Uh, and I know that people say we have to provide the longer, longer range of rockets so they actually can attack and hurt Russia inside the Russian territory. And of course, we have always been afraid and NATO has been afraid for, for escalation and that question will probably come even more in the front, front, forefront as we, as we move forward. And if that's not done, I guess it's a fairly good chance it will be some kind of frozen conflict. I mean, there are, and then of course you can ask what you do then. I think the best thing we in the West can do is provide the most military aid we can. Uh, it has to be up to the Ukrainians themselves when they want to start negotiating on how this, this should end, and we will certainly support them, support them in, in, in their efforts. And then after that, I mean, we, they need some kind of security guarantees. They can't get a NATO membership uh, if, if there is still Russian troops on their territory. Uh, so if they don't agree to give away territory, I mean, there won't be any Russian, there won't be any NATO membership. But certainly there could be military presence from NATO's countries in Ukraine. You could set up American troops, you could set up European troops, Norwegian troops, whatever. That's certainly a possibility to deter further Russian aggression. Uh, but, the, the, but that's, of course, will not end the conflict. And I'm just afraid that what's happening in Russia now is getting more and more aggressive. The Putin narrative is getting stronger and stronger. And we will really have a major and increasing challenge with our, our Russian neighbors. Also in Norway, we had the, one of the three countries, actually two, I guess, had a consulate in Murmansk. We had clo that's in the Russian side. We closed that down. So all this people-to-people -people cooperation right across the board has been closed most all of it. So I mean, and we are fully supporting the EU. But the thing is, like here, like in the Middle East, we don't really see any solution. I was quite involved in the Middle East myself many, many years ago, and 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 and. And, 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 and even then they said, you know, what is the solution on the longer term solution? We know that both parties have been unfairly treated, have been really bad, but, but even today, very few people, even here in the Czech Republic, are very pro-Israel, but you ask them, well, what do you think, what can the long term solution be? There is really nothing, you just shake your head, you have no idea. At some years ago, I think that was possible. We still in Norway believe in a two-state solution, but I mean, a two-state solution was undermined certainly by Hamas, it undermined the Palestinian Authority, and all, not least by Mr. Netanyahu, that actually tried to kill this even in the early 80s. So I mean, no one is for a one-state, a two-state solution, okay? And then if you have a one-state solution, you can't have a one-state solution with all the Jews living in that state solution without having some kind of discrimination. So then you have the choice about having a two-state solution that's not, not very likely, or having a one-state solution that is really not giving equal rights to everyone. And, I, and even if you ask the Israelis, they really don't know what they want. So really no one knows what they want. So that's, of course, the challenge that we only take one step at a time. And, and I, here I think it's fair to say that smaller countries like Norway and the Czech Republic, I mean, bigger countries aren't always smarter countries. Uh, that's my experience, at least. I mean, they have more diverse interests, but I mean, their kind of long-term thinking about what's possible is not necessarily smarter. Uh, and, uh, and, and so I think it's important that also smaller countries like ours have some kind of thinking, where could this end? And the reason for we should be particularly concerned about that is because we are so concerned, it's so important for us with this multilateral system. Because, I mean, we have kind of changed the global jungle to a global village in a way. We have rules now, we have a world order that's really very beneficial to smaller countries, but that is under attack. And I think we have a common interest and see to that that kind of survives. And here again, we have a major challenge because when we think on the shorter term and when we condemn Russia for bombing uh, civilian infrastructure in Ukraine and don't do the same on Gaza, we undermine the support for us in the third world and in the global south. And we need a global south to actually stand by us to uphold this international system. 
So re really what we are doing, I saw this very clearly. I was also worked in NATO, worked in Afghanistan, and we always looked at the short-term goals. And we won all the, bat all the smaller battles, but we lost the war. And that's exactly what's happening now. We are looking at smaller uh, questions, one and one, all the different conflicts, and we are undermining over kind of credibility in large parts of the world. And that's a problem for smaller countries. So my, 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 my point there would be that we should be more concerned about the rest of the world, how they kind of perceive the West, and not only on how we should act on this and this conflict. Thanks. Thank you very much. So let's open up for questions. There is a question in the very back. Perhaps a little bit. Thank you. And there might be some fluctuation in the room, which is linked to that some of our stu students here probably have to attend some other lectures at the same time. So just as an explanation, please. Uh, Norway is one of the main supplier of natural gas to, to EU right now. Aren't the Norway government is uh, for, uh, scared that there can be a proxy war with Russia or any other destabilization of the government? Because it will be favor for Russia if there's going to be any conflict with Norway right now. Will it be regarding the Iceland, as you mentioned this, uh, I forgot the name, Steinberg, the Iceland that is claimed by Norway, but Moscow as well claims it. Will there be any concentrations, you think, any proxy wars or anything in the future? Thank you very much. Let's go back to more questions, if you don't mind. You can answer them together. So we have two questions in the front, one here, and then Michael Kormash here in front. Please. Uh, yeah, good morning. Uh, I just wanted to ask in regarding to the state of Norwegian neutrality. Uh, my, my father is Swiss, so I have heard lots of talks of neutral, staying away from confrontation, staying away from global decision making. So my question is, does uh, Norwegian neutrality really just uh, throws back to the old world and Norway is just preferring to stay out of decision making because, as has been said, it favors them in terms of energy supply, in terms of decision making, they can basically only decide what they want to adapt and they are not forced to implement everything whilst uh, their former prime minister is leading NATO. So is, is neutrality just a call to the old world or is it really what uh, Norway desires? Let's take one more question, Michael. Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, my question is now, in a lot of like newspaper articles after the war, Norway is portrayed both as the hero, providing gas to all of the Europe, the rest of the Europe, but also a villain who made a lot of money from selling gas on above average prices of the market. Now, you spoke a lot about how Norway is a small country in terms of population, but also a huge country in terms of territory, middle country in terms of economy, how you profit how you profit from the from the working international order. So now if you have all this money, like, you know, as a result of the crisis, of the energy crisis, did it change anything on Norway's position towards the international order? Do you throw more money on the international order now than you used to? Or do you feel like you should take like larger, I don't know, larger position in a negotiating or for instance somehow like pursuing some sort of resolution of the conflict? Is it something that's happening in Norway? Or is it still the politics as usual as you either said in the in the first presentation there? Thank you. Thank you very much. First of all, I'm not, not really sure I got the first questions uh, understood that, but let me take the, the, the second and the third. Norway is not a neutral country. I mean, we are a full member of NATO, and Jens Stoltenberg, and actually I headed a campaign to get him elected to NATO. That wasn't so difficult because both Merkel and Obama supported him. But anyway, uh, and, 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 uh, and, and he, well, and his views are pretty much like our views. I mean, we, 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 we are a strong supporter of NATO, and we are, have exactly the same position towards Russia as the European Union. 
But as a neighboring country with a different tradition, I think it's fair to say that we also have some other, some other kind of uh, uh, elements that we think should be brought into the discussion. But certainly we stand behind, 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 behind the EU, EU policy also, also there. Regarding the gas, I mean, Norway and the Czech Republic, we had an agreement of delivering gas to the Czech Republic from 1997 to 2017. That was a long-term contract with fair prices. The European Union told us that this was a breach of the free market. So then we had to go into a spot price. And the reason why the gas price was so high was because it was spot price. We have always been for long-term agreements, but it, we, we had to follow the EU because we are part of the internal market. So, so, but it's true that this portrait brought Norway a lot of income. I think it's also true that said that in Norway, as one of the very few countries, I think maybe the only one, that has provided some of that aid, we have decided to provide aid to Ukraine for a five-year period. Uh, and, and with, the, with the, the, I think we are number four, if you take that into account, of all the countries that has actually de delivered humanitarian or, or has promised humanitarian and, and military aid. So, I mean, we have used a lot of that money also for Ukraine, and I'm sure we will come in to do that. We are also, of course, using that money for extra development aid, to keeping up the development aid as it goes down in many countries to the third world, we are increasing and so forth. So, I mean, we, we are using substantial part of that, that money to other issues. Let me also say, I mean, it's not only Norway. I mean, all your own energy companies, your, the Czech energy companies owe money. All energy companies owe money. And we have said, if, and I remember when you had the presidency uh, last year, you had our Minister of Energy here, Prime Minister, everyone here, and we were clear, I mean, EU gets an agreement of a fund or something that you can support, we will gladly support it. But you can't really expect Norway to make a system for the European Union if they don't agree themselves. But we will certainly work with the European Union and your countries to support, I think we would support whatever arrangement you agreed upon. And that, of course, what we have done also. Uh, yes, the first question, as I said, maybe you can come back to that because I'm not sure I really understood it. Thank you. Uh, if I understood the first question well, uh, it was about proxy wars and whether I'm, I'm actually expecting proxy wars to break out. Uh, proxy wars simply means that uh, a war between two parties is, is also a war between two other parties, two or more other parties that support those two that are fighting. So, for example, the Angolan Civil War was in some case a proxy war in the sense that uh, there were three different uh, movements, one supported by the West, one supported by the Soviet Union, and one supported by China. Uh, Korea and Vietnam can be called proxy wars because they were supported with either side in the Cold War, etc. And my answer to the question is no. I don't see that happening at, at this stage. And uh, uh, the place where it's most interesting to ask the question would not be Europe, I think. It would be the places where Wagner were uh, most uh, uh, active in sub-Saharan Africa, places like Burkina Faso and Mali, where you could imagine something like a proxy war, but with Russia so tied up with what's going on at home, I, and with Wagner being in the state of turmoil that it is, it now has a new leader, and it's becoming more an official branch of, 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 of Russian security policy, but still, I, I cannot see it coming in the short term. Uh, I agree with, with the Americans on the overall picture. Uh, if we look at this, and I'm not saying this in order to be nasty, I'm saying this if we think in terms of the overall geopolitical situation in the world. Russia's aggressive war against Ukraine is a distraction because the key conflict in the world is the one between the US and China. And there we can imagine proxy wars actually happening uh, in a number of places. Uh, the Philippines, Malaysia, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think the, new, the neutrality question has been answered. Just sort of a point of clarification because neutrality is also something discussed when it comes to Ukraine. Uh, Russians have consistently said that they want uh, denazification of Ukraine, by which, if I read this correctly, they mean regime change. 
which means that they arrogate to themselves the right to decide what kind of regime will exist in Ukraine. Now that means that they're trying to make Ukraine into a client state or eventually to sort of uh, annex the entire state. Right? Uh, that is not neutrality. Neutrality historically comes in two versions. One country can actually declare itself neutral, which is the Swiss case. But there's also something called permanent neutrality, which means that uh, you have guaranteed neutrality by the great powers. Luck, uh, sort of, uh, uh, Luxembourg would historically, no, sorry, Liechtenstein, uh, no. Um, um, Luxembourg would, 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 would historically be an example of that because they had a huge fortress and it was in the interest of the surrounding great powers that that fortress was not held by anybody so the surrounding powers went together and guaranteed the neutrality of Luxembourg. And this is a model that has been discussed for Ukraine. But the problem with it is that if you guarantee the neutrality of another country, you have to be in good faith. You have to be bona fide, as they say, in order that you will actually do so. And given Russia's behavior and, uh, and towards Ukraine, uh, it is very, the Ukrainians have no reason whatsoever to think that Russia has an actual bona fide reason to guarantee their neutrality. They want to make their country into a client state or even an exit. So I see no neutrality on the, on the table there. Um, as to the uh, question of windfall profit, I mentioned in my talk that I think there are good arguments that Norway should give even more than we do in support for Ukraine, exactly because we get the windfall. This has been discussed in, in, in Europe, and my position is a minority position. That does not mean that it has gone away. Um, and, uh, I also again refer to the oil and gas as a topic for the next panel. What is going on between Germany and Norway here is super important, but I'm not the right person to talk about it. Thank you very much. I think we have time for at least two more questions. I see one question here. Gentlemen in the front. Uh, Professor Neumann, I think um, and Mr. Ambassador shares your position or view on seeing the parallel between Gaza being bombed and Ukraine being bombed. That's a, that's a position I, if I understand correctly, if that's your position, I have to fundamentally disagree. Um, it's not. It's not just you know s some place, some country being bombed. It's a moral, deep moral question. And here's a here's a party that is uh, defending itself against the threat of being annihilated. We know that the. Uh, what the Charter of Hamas uh, contains, the uh, uh, annihilation of Israel or killing Jews or whatever, how, how it's put there, it's not important. Simply that's their goal and that has been the goal of all uh, surrounding countries for decades. So it's absolutely incomprehensible to me how you can not see this uh, world of a difference between self-defensive war of, of uh, Israel bombing the enemy. It's like, you know, if, if, if you were uh, condemning uh, Churchill or, or uh, you know, the Allied forces, you know, when they were bombing Germany. I mean, this is absolutely incredible to me how you cannot see this, yeah. Okay, thank you. Do we have one more question? And then we will ask uh, Professor Neumann and Ambassador Rennenberg to answer, please. Hello, uh, it was amazing hearing the conference. Thank you so much. I just wanted to actually talk about the same point that uh, Mr. Here just uh, commented on. Um, yeah, it is very different because one is genocide and one is a war, and, uh, or one is a conflict about the territory and one is a complete genocide of people. So what I wanted to say it is actually an amazing point about like uh, working on long-term solutions rather than short-term ones, but I really believe that in some points we need to work on short-term solutions because, I mean, 
it's just more casualties, more people dying. It's, yeah, I mean, I'm gonna speak like this is better because of the thingy, okay. Thank you, thank you. I think the question is clear. So, who would like to begin? Well, thank you. I'd like to thank the gentleman here for, uh, for a question that we, that we often do. And we see the difference. We see the difference between Russia, that is actually bombing and killing civilians in a country that tried to, uh, try to occupy an aggressive part. See, no problem with that. And, and then certainly Israel that, 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 that have chosen a strategy that they believe this is the best way to defend themselves for Hamas, as you said, that has, uh, has as a goal as a eradicated state of Israel. No problem with that. Uh, there are two challenges, however. The first is that many countries in the world don't see that. And many countries in the global south don't see that. Uh, you know, we had the, the, the resolution of General Assembly here about a couple of weeks ago, where, where 120 countries, you know, voted for a ceasefire, Norway among them, Czechia, and four other European countries voted against. It was eight countries, I think, including the United States. Uh, uh, but certainly that was a huge minority. So anyway, the way you look at it, it was a very minority way. I, uh, uh, but that's, of course, okay. It's your right to do that. But the thing is, that even if there are different moral ways of looking at it, international law is the same. And according to international law, there is a clear breach of both Russia and Israel when it comes to international law. That's clearly said by the UN, it's clearly said by the <laughs> most authoritative. And then, of course, you can say that we have the moral aspect, we have so morally right that we can break international law. That's, of course, a way to put it. But we do not support that because that will undermine the whole basis for the international order we all depend on. So here I think we just disagree. Uh, regarding on the, yeah, on the ceasefire, I mean, uh, well, on the, on the short, of course, we have to handle it both in the shorter term and long term. I was a lot in, in Israel and Gaza and West Bank. I've been there many times. In fact, I've been to the West Bank Gaza much more often than the Israeli prime minister, I found out. But anyway, the challenge there is that they never thought about the longer term. I mean, we had a lot of bombings going on in the 90s. I agree with that. But then, of course, they built a wall. And we said, OK, we build a wall. Now we have to try to see what can be the longer term solution here. Uh, because it was a short term thing, but nothing was done. They moved 700 uh, Israeli settlers into the West Bank and undermined the whole prospect of a, of a two state solution. So actually, time worked again. And we told them, you know, there used to be 20,000, you know, uh, Palestinians on the West Bank. You know, now there are <laughs> 3 million. I mean, they are increasing extremely rapidly. And the same on the, uh, sorry, on the Gaza and on the West Bank. The, the problem is just increasing. What are you doing? Time is not working for you. And there was no reply. Well, we don't know. There was no caring about it. And I think that's the problem many places. We have to think long term while we are trying to handle the short term challenges. But they're just emotions, feelings, hatred doesn't really solve any problem. That's at least our experience. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, on the question of, of short term and long term, uh, that's a tactical question. Uh, you have to have detailed knowledge of the situation on the ground in order to answer that. And uh, in order to have knowledge detailed enough, you have to have classified material, and I don't work with classified material, so you will excuse me that I don't answer it. Uh, as to the question of the parallel between uh, what's happening in Gaza and what's happening in Ukraine, no parallel is perfect. But I would agree with the ambassador, and I would like to, to sort of add two things. I mean, one thing is that, uh, that uh, what's happening in Gaza is of Israel's doing. I mean, Gaza is becoming less and less territory. 2.3 million people are in there, 43% of whom are, uh, are children. And these people have nowhere to go. They have no future. 
Is it then sort of surprising that they strike out and lash out the terrorist organization like Hamas can have, uh, uh, can have a fertile place to work? And when you add that Netanyahu has, uh, has uh, privileged consistently to divide the Palestinians between the West Bank and Gaza instead of trying to deter Hamas, you have a problem that is of Israel's making. And the second thing, I would like to take uh, uh, exception to what you said uh, about British bombing of Germany. Uh, it is a, st a st standard case in the literature on just war that what, uh, what Britain did in the final days of the Second World War, the bombing of Dresden, for example, was not proportional. It is not according to, uh, to the, to the, to, to, uh, to, uh, the uh, laws of war to bomb indiscriminately the way that was done. And this comes to the surface in Britain at, regular, at irregular intervals. Uh, the biggest so far was in the 1980s when someone suggested a statue, a monument, to Bomber Harris, the one who was in charge of this in London. And there was massive resistance against this because Bomber Harris was also the man who ordered uh, the firebombing of Dresden. So, uh, so uh, this, that parallel, I, I think, uh, may strike both ways. But we have uh, veered away from Ukraine and towards the world at large, and maybe that's exactly as it should be, because uh, Ukraine is, to begin with, a regional conflict. But given the situation of, of, of Russia and China and all this, it is also of the essence for the, for the, for the coming sort of new uh, world order. So thank you. Thank you very much. We are entering issues of a broader world order, and we are also running out of time. So I would like to thank very much Professor Neumann for joining us here today, and Mr. Ambassador Runneberry. Thank you very much. I think an applause for that. And now I would like to invite you for some refreshments, which are being served in the room in the cafeteria, which is just across the corridor here. And we'll begin again at quarter past 11 with the next panel. Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me well? Yes. Welcome to this uh, panel number two in, at today's uh, conference. Um, I'm glad to see you here. Um, I think we will just start. Uh, my name is uh, Paul Chesmo. I'm a uh, senior researcher at the Fritjof Nansen Institute uh, and a participator in this project. Um, unlike most of you, I'm not a political scientist or a student of international relations. I'm a social anthropologist, but I've worked my, in my research career in, uh, on environmental politics in Russia, environmental organizations in the South Caucasus, and I've also followed the region with great interest, including the development in developments in Ukraine. Um, so before we start with, uh, with the first presentation, let me just uh, briefly introduce the panelists. So we have uh, Martin Subko, which is a PhD student uh, at the Metropolitan University. Uh, and also an associate with the um, Institute of International Relations here in Prague. And then Mats Braun, which uh, presented himself in the last panel, is the director of the same institute. Then my uh, colleague, Ariel Mu from the Fritjof Nansen Institute, a senior researcher who has been conducting research for a long, long time on Russia, on energy politics, gas market, the Russian gas market, and also the Russian-Norwegian bilateral relations. And then, finally, um, Pavlina Janabova from uh, the Association of, for International Affairs, which is, as far as I understand, a think tank providing policy guidance and conducting, well, uh, assignments and, and contract research uh, on behalf of uh, various Czech institutions. Uh, the way we will organize this panel is uh, that uh, Martin Subko, who has conducted uh, some research on, uh, on the topic of a coherent EU diplomacy in the face of war in Ukraine, striving for a unified response, he will present his research. Then the three panelists will be given just a couple of minutes each to provide their comments on Martin's research. And then after that, 
Um, Pavlina, Aril, and Mats will also uh, be given some around 10 minutes, I guess, each um, to talk a bit wider on the topic of this conference, namely European diplomacy amidst Russia's war in Ukraine. And uh, obviously you will have your different perspectives and that is how we will hope that this will be a, a good and engaging discussion. And uh, there will be also open for, uh, opened up for questions from the audience. Um, so without much further ado then, I will give, uh, give the floor to Martin who will um, provide the research that uh, he has conducted. So, welcome, the floor is yours, and the microphone. Thank you very much. Is the sound all right? Can you hear me? Yeah? Okay, good. Dear folks, friends, fellow students, and distinguished scholars, the war in Ukraine transcends regional boundaries, acting as a vital benchmark for the wider challenges encountered by the EU in shaping and maintaining its foreign policy. As we gather here today, it's crucial to recognize the human toll of this conflict. People are losing their lives at this very moment. Infrastructure is being destroyed and the land is littered with landmines. Many families are suffering the loss of fathers, mothers, and children in his ongoing war. The magnitude of displacement of Sagaring with millions forced to flee the homeland in search of safety. In the face of these challenges, we must remember the timeless principle that has guided the European Union since its inception, the power of unity. It is unity that has enabled us to transcend historical divisions, promote peace, and advance prosperity across our continent. More importantly than ever, this unity has been reflected in the EU's stance towards the war in Ukraine through 11 packages of sanctions against Russia. Europeans have worked with value-based obligations rooted in the fundamental charter of the EU. It's crucial to emphasize the six core values of the European Union. Human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and human rights. However, as academics, we need to take a close look at all the actions of the European Union taken since the war in Ukraine started, February 2022. There was something quite shocking in Joseph Borrow's speech in April 2022 when he said, one billion euro is what we pay to Putin every day for energy he provided us. Since the beginning of the war, we have given him 35 billion euros. Compare that to one billion that we have given to Ukraine in arms and weapons. Quite shocking, isn't it? I read those words several times while thinking, do I want to live in such union where the power of unity is losing its footing at this ratio to Vladimir Putin? So I began looking into this using the EU values and energy security as tools to find out what's really going on. I want to share the few basic ideas from my upcoming article, not by lecturing you, but by inviting you and provoking a new way of seeing. Firstly, the title of my paper, Coherent EU Diplomacy in the Face of the War in Ukraine, Striving for a Unified Response, tells you that I focus on the implementation of the concept of external coherence in the EU diplomacy during the war in Ukraine. This concept of external coherence is characterized as the capacity to uniformly convey a singular diplomatic stance across various diplomatic settings. Those settings are, for example, sanctions, structure of sanctions, or energy diplomacy settings, from whom the EU is buying as a block oil or natural gas. 
There are three assumptions about this concept that I developed. Firstly, external coherence should be anchored in the EU legal frameworks while simultaneously being entwined with the national legislation of member states. This demands more than mere harmonizations of the EU directives with the national blueprints. It also mandates the diligent implementation of the core EU values. Secondly, is the nuanced interplay of foreign policy dialogues between the EU central entities and the individual member states. And this is notably via the European External Action Service and the European Commission that poses challenges, particularly when a single dissenting member state can upset the balance. This requires not only a robust mechanism of coordination and communication, but also a well-defined penalty system for the member states serving as a deterrent to ensure adherence to collective decisions and goals. The third assumption, often overshadowed yet essential, pertains to the foreign policy discourse articulated by external actors engaged with the EU, predominantly states and international organizations, thus providing a consistent and adaptive response to ensure that the Union's strategic interests and values are effectively represented and defended on the global stage. For this coherence to be truly meaningful, three pivotal criteria must be satisfied. Firstly, there should be the consistency across diverse diplomatic contexts to ensure longevity. Secondly, its application should be pragmatic, particularly in negotiations, in the practical negotiations. And lastly, such coherence must demonstrate, must demonstrate resilience capable of withstanding pressures, whether originating from the internal lobbying or external influences. Therefore, the study advances the idea that external coherence is gauged by the extent to which the European Union foreign policy is coherent with and complementary to foreign policy of the individual member states. And then it's discursively disseminated in EU diplomatic engagement with external entities. When researching, I worked with four actors. Joseph Borrell discourse, who is the high representative of the EU for foreign affairs and security policy and also vice president of the European Commission. The second was Jan Lipavsky, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Czechia, and he provides insights into the complexities inherent to the EU member states. Then we have Peter Siatros, Hungary's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Trade, who serves as a testament to the challenges within the European Union. Hungary's selective policy alignment often poses the questions on the coherence and strategy of the EU foreign policy initiatives. And lastly, Anniken Heidfeld, role as a Minister of Foreign Affairs for the Kingdom of Norway, offers an external viewpoint. So those were four actors. I split my research into two parts. The first part looks at how these four actors align with the EU values and how this affects the EU's external unity. The second part focuses on the using energy security and energy diplomacy to gauge the actual commitment of the EU and its member countries to these values. In a simple terms, it's about when a member state supports sanctions against Russia, but still imports some of this energy from Russia. So what are my discoveries, my findings? While the European External Service Action and Norway stand as the paragon of adherence to these values, the divergent positions of Hungary and Czechia reveal deep-seated ideological fissures with the Union. These divisions are not simply policy disagreements. They represent a profound ideological discord 
that threatens to undermine the EU's normative framework. This discord highlights the limitations of existing mechanism for ensuring external coherence as a mandate by Article 10A of Treaty of Lisbon. In the complex arena of EU energy diplomacy, the divergent stances of Joseph Borrell Peter Seattle, Jan Lipowski, and Annick Heidfeld reveal a multi layer tapestry of challenges to the EU's external coherence. Borrell promotes the European vision, emphasizing sustainability and lessening Russian reliance, while Seattle prioritizes Hungary's energy ties with Russia. Lipowski balances the EU values with energy security, and Hatfield, as an external figure, aligns with EU, but also she is expressing the caution against the overly relying on external sources. These divergent narratives unearth underlying geopolitical complexities, thereby highlighting the limitations of the supranational governance in attaining external coherence. Such inconsistencies also compromise the clarity and predictability of the EU diplomacy on the global stage, making it challenging for international partners to understand the Union's strategic intentions. The EU's pursuit of external coherence presents a challenge, one that is amplified by an ongoing Ukraine conflict. This research not only uncovers intricate tapestry of interests, priorities, and convictions that the EU must navigate, but also opens the door for further scholarly investigations into the mechanism that could enhance the external coherence of EU diplomacy. In an era defined by geopolitical flux and continuous recalibration of power dynamics, the aspiration of the European Union for external coherence in its diplomacy takes on critical importance. The ongoing conflict in Ukraine serves as a pivotal case study, prompting re-evaluation of the EU diplomatic architecture. The concept of external coherence emerged as a salient analytical tool, illuminating the EU's capacity to respond to geopolitical crises and molds its global image. The study shows that while the Ukraine crisis has galvanized a semblance of unity in the EU's stance towards Russia, this degree of external coherence is not universally manifest across the Union's diplomatic spectrum. Some numbers from November 2023. Madrid, 1.8 billion euros. Paris, 1.5 billion euros. Brussels, 1.36 billion euros. What are these figures? That's what the EU has paid since January 2023 to Russia for LNG supplies. Shocking. Do you feel Europeans? Our union is a testament of what can be achieved when the nations come together in pursuit of shared values and common goals. The very essence of the European project is rooted in the belief that the cooperation is not just a choice, but a necessity. As we confront the complexities of our time, the principle becomes more relevant than ever. As Mario Draghi stated for Financial Times, either Europe acts together and becomes a deeper union, a union capable of expressing a foreign policy and a defense policy, aside from all economic policies. Or, I'm afraid the European Union will not survive other than being a single market. Diplomacy, the art of dialogue and negotiation, is the instrument through which we exercise a commitment to peace and, di and diplomacy as a forge, as a, as a force to provide good for the planet. It's through diplomacy that we seek to resolve conflicts, promote human rights, uphold the rule of law. It's diplomacy that allows us to engage with the world, build partnerships, and foster understanding among nations. If I were Ukrainian, I might ask my European friends to take a good look in a mirror. 
how would you feel about your moral principles on one side where you categorically condemn Russian aggression and on the other side your consequentialist reasoning provides funding to Russia as you buy LNG from them. Hence, my academic contribution invites you to engage in a discussion around significant question. What should be the supreme principle of the unified EU diplomacy? Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, I will now invite the other panels, panelists just to give some brief uh, comments uh, on your presentation. Um, but just to note that, as far as I understand, this uh, I know has been developed into a paper, which is now under review in an international peer-reviewed journal. So it's a serious uh, research work. So that's good. Uh, we'll start with Mats. Just some brief comments regarding. Uh, this presentation and oh, Martin's work. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you, Paul. Uh, I will be very brief here. Uh, I mean, we have been discussing your paper previously, and I will not go into the details of the paper, but just on some general ideas that Martin presented here. Of course, the issue of coherence in relation to EU diplomacy is a crucial topic. And I like the way you bring in coherence. In the paper, you define it as something more than only the lack of inconsistencies. And of course, it brings us back to a big discussion which has been ongoing for years about the European Union as an actor in international relations. We had Henry Kissinger many years ago asking the famous question, what is the number to Europe? In other words, whom do you call if you want to speak to someone about the EU's position? And you have had many jokes about that topic, referring to you reach an answering machine that would say, do you want to hear the position of the President of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, please dial one. If you want to hear the position of uh, the High Representative, please dial two. If you want to hear the position of Germany, three, France, four, etc., etc. It's quite an awful joke, but, but it makes a relevant point in the question of can uh, coherency be achieved. And what, I mean, you focus on the discourses, the rhetoric, where perhaps the differences would be more visible than elsewhere. We should remember as a background to this discussion that the European Union has been able to launch 11 sanction packages against Russia since the beginning of the full-scale Russian invasion, and you had some sanctions, softer sanctions, in place already prior to that since 2014. And so in that sense, we have some coherence, we have some ability to deliver. Obviously though, the discourse is very different, and you refer to the resilience here, how long the duration of this united approach of EU can last, and that is even more tricky. Yes, let me point out one point, because I think I like in your paper very much as well that you start with values. And of course, if we go back uh, to, to the Lisbon Treaty, to the treaty framework, we find some references there to the values that the European Union is intended to protect. But it's not always completely clear what kind of foreign policy that will lead to, because these terms are quite abstract. And of course, the, the whole discussion, if we look at Article 2 in the, in, the, in the Lisbon Treaty, would start by describing the European Union's aim in relation to the external world is to promote peace, its values, and the well-being of its people. Uh, peoples, with an S, I'm sorry. And of course, some would argue that there can be a contradiction here in these goals. So that is just to say, it's not always quite straightforward how we make the connection between values, which are also defined when referring to peace, democracy, equality, solidarity, and so on, sustainability. But it's not always completely clear what is the actual outcome when it comes to foreign policy based on some specific values. And so, so this is something to reflect about, which then brings back to the issue of coherence. I will say something more later, but I think I will, should give the floor to, to my colleagues here to have some more time to speak, in particular since we have uh, distinguished guests 
from a country far away as well being present here. <laughs> thank you, Mats. Uh, Aril, you can just provide your brief comments. Oh, uh, thank Martin. you. Um, uh, thank you, Martin. You have, uh, I think, done an important job, and uh, what you very important to sort of to clarify some of the sort of fundamental issues and um, and concepts, coherence, uh, consistency, and so forth. I will just uh, make a few com com uh, comments on the sort of more specific um, empirical focus of this um, presentation and your paper. <coughs> Yes, you point out uh, lack of coherence in the EU diplomacy when basically comparing declarations of support for Ukraine with the energy supply policies of member states in the EU. Uh, and rightly, you point out that you find there is, you don't really f see uh, that this is a case of coherent policies. Um, I think uh, Mats already said something which is very important about uh, EU policies with regard to, to sanctions. But it remains a fact that um, uh, several members of the EU continue to, to purchase <coughs> energy uh, from, from Russia. Um, so uh, you are you're very critical on this account. But what can you really expect? Uh, I think, in a way, what you uh, assume is that, you know, everything is, uh, EU policies are all sort of uh, supposed to be uh, coordinated according to a, a, a overall goal. But in, 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 in fact, the states have several goals. And, and, and goals, as I think you said, Mats, are not by themselves always um, consistent, even if they, the separate goals are legitimate uh, in themselves. Uh, <coughs> security policy, sort of uh, support for uh, rule of law, values, if you like, certainly a goal. But um, energy security, supply security, is also a goal, it's also a le legitimate uh, goal. So in the, in the, in the real world, all, all states, they, they strike a balance between different goals. It's not only so that one goal overrides everything else. Um, and the, in, in, the, in this situation we are now with, with, uh, with sanctions against um, uh, against the uh, Russian energy exports with the, with the goal of, uh, of um, reducing the income of the Russian state. Take the US, the United States, seen as a very staunch uh, supporter of, of sanctions. Well, if you followed this idea that the only goal is to hurt Russia, then of course you would advocate for a maximum blockade of Russian oil exports. That would really hurt Russia. But as is seen, for instance, by the United States, doing so would also create, would create other problems. The national oil market would be sort of in a frenzy, with rising oil prices hurting the US, but global economy would very big possible repercussions. So consequently, the, 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 the sanctions that were imposed against Russian oil have a sort of this specific uh, construction where they try to deny income but not to reduce the volume of, of exports by introducing a, a ceiling <coughs> on, on, the, on the price Russia can, can take. Just showing, you know, that Yes, there are other concerns than, than only hurting uh, Russia. And um, it is also, you may say, uh, in the, one of the cases you mentioned, possible to make the same argument. You mentioned the continued import, or increasing, in fact, imports of Russian liquefied natural gas. Uh, last uh, year and this year, the 
volumes sold in Europe of liquefied natural gas, uh, particularly from, or only from the Russian Arctic, from the Yamal LNG, have been soaring to, to 15 million tons. Uh, not a huge part of the gas market, but still an important. So you, 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 you say, that, well, this, this shows in a way the duplicity or the incoherence, well, but it also can be seen as a way of stabilizing the energy supply situation of, of Europe, which many politicians would say is extremely important to keep political stability in Europe. There is no doubt about it that from the Russian point of view, the, the cutoff in the gas deliveries to Europe, in pipeline gas deliveries, were expected to create social and political turmoil. So it's not so easy to say what is the right mix. Uh, but uh, because keeping, if, if you believe there is a, cont uh, is, is a, is a, con uh, is, is a, uh, is a link between uh, energy supply situation and political stability, well, then you must also take that into account, even if you are advocating strong measures against Russia. So, uh, so that is why my main, my main, uh, my main uh, point that it, it's, it cannot just assume that everything can be subsumed under a policy to, 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 uh, to criticize or even, even hurt uh, Russia. It, it, other goals are also legitimate. I can come back to some of these issues later on. Thank you. And then uh, Pavlina, some short comments. Thank you very much. Um, I think um, I will be very brief in my reaction to the article. I liked the article very much, and I think it was a very thought-provoking, especially in its work with uh, various concepts. Um, and it uh, brought many, many ideas to, at least for me, to, to think about further. Um, um, I would uh, probably start with the more general note that um, in the European Union, the unity actually isn't a rule, but it's an exception, and it, it, it has been an exception when it comes to uh, Ukraine. And um, we see that currently that uh, the, um, the unity that the European Union had or has, has had towards uh, Ukraine <coughs> uh, isn't really the case when it comes to the uh, to, to Middle East. Also, and um, the, here I would... Uh, repeat a little bit of what uh, what Mats already said. The EU core values are um, defined in a rather abstract manner, and they are open to wide interpretation uh, by by many actors, um, and they can then be operation, op operationalized uh, differently by, by uh, the member states. Um, it. Um, also brings me to a thought that, um, unfortunately, it's not moral principles that uh, solely guides the foreign policy. Uh, and it's uh, also interests, and the interests uh, somehow or sometime uh, are or can be contradictory to the values as they are defined by the European Union. Uh, what I um, would, what, what, what I think would be a, a good way to perhaps uh, add to the article would be um, more cases to um, inspect uh, not only um, the coherence uh, on the level on the uh, at the level of the European Union but perhaps also more um, actors and speakers uh, inside of the individual member states so that we could um, also see how exact uh, how, how coherent uh, is the foreign policy discourse in relation to the um, values as defined by the European Union even inside of the uh, EU member states that means to what extent what is the relationship in the individual member states between uh, the EU level and their own uh, foreign policy also, uh, and that I guess is a, uh, would be a topic for a whole different article, uh, is um, what, what can actually be done? Uh, how should or how can the European Union ensure that uh, it is more united in the future? Thank you very much, Pavlina. Um, and thank you all for your comments to Martin's um, research. Um, I think we can move on then to uh, the more general uh, debate 
on uh, European diplomacy amidst Russia's war in Ukraine. Um, and I've decided to change the order slightly of the speakers. Uh, we'll start with Mats, because you said um, at the introduction of this uh, conference that uh, the European Union might head for 36 member states, but as of yet it is only 28. Uh, in, in with reference to, huh? I'm sorry, 27. Yeah. That's, that's the social anthropologist in me, I don't have those. Uh, numbers uh, correct, but still, in the case of Ukraine, it is uh, quite normal to talk about the 26 plus one, because there are a lot of countries that agree quite rapidly on the sanctions, and then you have Hungary. So I, I as, uh, expect much that you will talk about the European integration, about uh, how uh, European states uh, collaborate, and then uh, Pavlina will say a few words about the role of Hungary, and then there is, you know, Russia, which I guess Adil will talk about uh, related to his uh, research, but also related to the wider topic of this um, conference. So the floor is yours, uh, Mats. You have approximately 10 minutes each, and then we'll have questions from the floor after that. I think I will probably be much shorter than, than 10 minutes, but, but thank you again for uh, giving me the word once more here. And the question of unity will obviously be even more challenged as we move on. And let's get me back. You asked about the enlargement here. When, when I said in the beginning and the opening of the, the event today, this number 36, which might sound highly utopian, that we will have 36 member states by 2030. But this is referring to then the report by the European Commission, which came was it two weeks ago or was it last week? Uh, which is then recommended the beginning of negotiations, also with Ukraine under some conditions, and uh, also taken into account then as other candidate countries, Moldova and Georgia, and uh, also six countries in the Western Balkans. So in that sense, this would be a huge, rapid change to the European Union. and. Of course, in the light of such a potential big change, we are likely to see the idea of unity getting even more challenged than it has been so far. I would say from my perspective, the EU's approach after the Russian full-scale invasion has actually been surprisingly united. But it's even we, and I think Pavlina will speak more about Hungary, so I will not say too much about that at this point, but we should not forget that Hungary has still agreed to all those sanction packages. The European Union has managed to use the peace facility, peace facility mechanism to issue joint procurement of ammunition for Ukraine, provide other military equipments for Ukraine, and has actually been able to do that in a very surprisingly, from my perspective at least, united way. Now, of course, given that the, the war has been portrayed since its beginning, at least since the beginning of this phase of the war. Maybe we should be clear about saying that the war actually started in 2014. But when we talk about it now here, we mostly refer to the full, after the full-scale, attempted full-scale invasion of, of uh, uh, Ukraine by Russia, which started in February last year. And since then, uh, this war has been very much portrayed as Ukraine defending Europe. Right? It's something which uh, President Zelensky spoke about in this way, but also many European leaders, including the President of the European Commission, has articulated this in this way, that we actually have a situation where Ukraine is defending a much more broader European order in this war, uh, which is then uh, uh, also a justification for, for taking measures to support, and of course we can discuss if it's going far enough, if uh, the blockage when it comes to energy should be more sufficient. I mean, Czech, Czechia is an example here where we have an exception when it comes to, to, to some uh, oil imports, uh, but at the same time being one of the countries with a very high profile in, in, in speaking up and favoring harder sanctions and so on. Uh, so that can all be discussed, but, 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 but uh, it has been very much portrayed uh, as this war defending the European order, calling then for a great deal of European unity. But we can see 
the more we bring in the cost element, and then we get back to, to the broader principles of the European Union when we come to the broader values, which is also about the well-being of, of the peoples, we get to see different, different constellations and different kind of nuances in this. I'm thinking more specifically, we had a long discussion if Central European countries are becoming more influential in the European Union as a consequence of the war if the center of gravity of the European Union is moving towards, towards the east in this respect, or towards the center, towards the center in Prague, obviously, uh, if that is a consequence of the war insofar as many of the countries in this region had called for the danger of Russia doing something much earlier, and we had other countries, Germany, notably, taking a much more pragmatic approach on Russia. And it has been a little bit, okay, we told you so, perspective from, uh, Polish side, from the Czech side from times, but we should not forget here that, that getting back to the unity that the Central European countries are very divided on the issue actually. Not only Hungary, but Slovakia after the election is also probably changing the position, right Daniela? And uh, we, we, we also see in Poland when you start talking about agricultural import, it gets much more complicated. And now we're getting back to this issue if it's actually realistic with an enlargement. And uh, I said nine new potential member states, but let's face it, all of them are small with one exception. The big country here with 40 million something inhabitants is Ukraine, obviously, and Ukraine would be the big issue. And if you look at opinion polls within Ukraine, you have a lot of, you have some support of 86%, I saw according to some opinion poll, in favor of membership. You have also some politicians as the Prime Minister in Ukraine, speaking about a fast accession within two years or something like that, which I think is something we need to take very seriously because this is likely to lead to a lot of disappointments because I don't think anyone would expect two years. 2030 is a year mentioned by the President of the European Council and is even that a very optimistic year in, according to many expectations. And what will challenge the unity is, of course, the cost side here. Uh, and it's, of course, linked to the EU's response to the war in general, because since Ukraine is defending European values and at the same time climbing, uh, representing a bid for membership, the enlargement is on the agenda. It's not something that the European Union can decide to accept on its agenda or decide not to have on its agenda, because it's there. Ukraine has applied, so it has to be dealt with, and there are big expectations that we are fighting the war for Europe. Now we want the reward as well, which can be seen as very fair point. But that brings, of course, very many new costs. You have a big country, which is a large agricultural sector, and it would mean changes to how resources are redistributed within the European Union. Countries like the Czech Republic would, need, would obviously move from being net receivers recipients from, from the common budget to become actually one of the countries that have to contribute more than it receives back, right? So you have a lot of these issues which will be saying that it can be very, very challenging. And of course, if it's feasible at all during a, a conflict taking place. We have had examples before of enlargement which a country with a non-settled border dispute, Cyprus. Uh, question is, how comparable that is and how, how that can move on. But uh, I will not go into the details. Uh, my main comment is the issue of coherence and unity will probably be even more important in the future. And it will obviously be more challenged as well. I will pass the microphone perhaps to. Thank you, Mats. And then Paulina. Thank you very much. Uh, to follow up on, uh, on maths, yes, I think the issue of unity will be even more important in the future. Uh, but we should probably discuss what the unity is and if it means that uh, all of the 27, 32, 30, <laughs> 36 countries uh, are 100% on board with everything that the, that the EU does. Um, that was just, just the side because I was, I was asked to, to speak about Hungary. Uh, which I will do, but um, I'm afraid I will have to uh, frame it in a more general um, EU context. Um, firstly, uh, there was a clearly defined ambition of the, European, of the current European Commission uh, to be a geopolitical actor. 
And um, so far, uh, the EU's in engagement and assistance that the EU provided uh, Ukraine since 2022 uh, has been a huge step towards uh, this goal, uh, I, would, I would argue. Um, unity, we can see as um, arguably a necessary condition for any um, attempting geopolitical actor or geopolitical player to uh, project influence and thus uh, project power. Uh, whereas um, incoherence uh, can seem uh, for an actor to be seen as uh, weak uh, in the eyes of, uh, of his or her opponents. Um, question is, um, how coherent does, does the EU actually need to be and how, how coherent it, it can be? Because um, currently we have 27 uh, member states um, and um, given the political system of the European Union, each of those uh, member states is entitled to have its own uh, foreign policy. Um, and um, the foreign policy of the individual member states uh, is uh, a result of um, many, many factors and uh, many elements are playing into how uh, a specific foreign policy, or what, what the specific foreign policy actually looks like. And um, as I said previously, it's not only political principles and it's not only values, but it's also um, hard interests, uh, it's um, history, it's the mentality, it's the specific uh, political leadership, and uh, here I'm, I'm uh, getting to, to the issue of Hungary, where obviously the political preferences uh, of the, political, lead of the uh, political leadership are um, very much uh, a forming factor of, of uh, what the Hungarian foreign and European policy looks like. Um, also, what uh, plays into that is um, actually the political representation's um, opinion uh, of the European Union and their priority as for um, how strong the European Union should be. And uh, speaking of, of Hungary, we clearly see that uh, the current um, political leadership, and when I say current, I mean almost 15 years, uh, um, he has been um, not very much in favor of, of a strong uh, European Union. Um, obviously, Hungary, um, when it comes to Ukraine, has been the odd one out um, in the, when, when it comes to the support of Ukraine and um, the willingness to um, combat Russia or, or to, uh, uh, to fight Russia. Um, um, if I get a little bit to the um, Fides uh, foreign policy principles, um, um, Hungarian foreign policy is actually um, is um, uh, at the moment um, execute, executed based on the um, uh, assumption that the world is uh, moving from the um, multilateral um, order towards um, what uh, people call multipolar multipolarism. Uh, which means that uh, Fidesz tries to balance between, its, between the commitments that um, Hungary has towards the political West while keeping uh, strong relations with uh, uh, countries, uh, with non-Western countries, among them, uh, of course, Russia, uh, regardless of what the uh, value affiliation of these countries are. Um, and if you look at the EU, uh, for, for Fidesz, uh, the European Union and its institution uh, do not uh, represent um, space for um, cooperation, but rather um, um, a subject against which uh, the, the government um, tries to define uh, itself and its own interest. Um, in this context, it's, it's, not really, it's not very surprising that the rhetorics of the Hungarian politicians, or especially one politician who really is the head of everything in the country, and by that I obviously mean the, uh, the foreign uh, not the foreign minister, <laughs> the foreign minister, um, uh, that his rhetorics and the rhetorics of, of his people is, um, um, yeah, is uh, not very much not in line or something at least sometimes very much not in line with the um, EU mainstream. Um, I already said that um, the mem I point pointed uh, at, at the fact that uh, the member states are still the most important actors uh, in, the, um, in the European Union. Um, and that makes, um, however despicable, uh, the, the behavior of the Hungarian government 
um, it is legitimate and it, and it is in the boundaries of, uh, of, of the legal setting uh, of the European Union. The question is, and that is more of a um, thing, thing to think about, um, is, um, is this um, behavior, is the behavior that the, Hung that the Hungarian government uh, has been showing, uh, is it acceptable uh, among allies and what does constitute uh, appropriate, appropriate relations uh, among uh, allies? Um, and I would argue uh, the key concepts uh, when it comes to um, relations between allies are trust, uh, predictability, uh, and reliability. And uh, Hungary arguably hasn't been showing uh, much of that. Uh, and um, instead of it, it has been uh, showing uh, transactionalism, um, essentially putting a price tag on everything that um, the Hungarian political representation agrees to at the European level. Um, so yes, uh, Hungary eventually agreed to um, all 11 sanction uh, packages, and um, that is seeing the uh, glass half full. Uh, but um, at the same time, we have seen uh, the Hungarian Prime Minister taking a picture with, uh, with uh, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin in Beijing, uh, was it a, a couple weeks ago? And uh, um, that is something that doesn't really um, contribute to, to the picture of, of a united, uh, of, to the image of a united uh, European Union. Um, I would argue that um, the difference between Hungary and um, perhaps some other states that uh, um, also voice their requirements when it comes to the specific uh, setting of, of the sanctions against Russia, um, Hungary doesn't really hesitate and um, Hungary chooses to um, make uh, these, um, these requirements and uh, voicing their, uh, their priorities publicly. And that is something that, uh, in my opinion, undermines um, the, the unity and the coherence of the European Union, as I spoke about it in the, in the beginning of, of my contribution, in the eyes of uh, not only people in Europe, but also in the, obviously in the eyes of, of Vladimir Putin, uh, among others. Um, uh, perhaps a few, um, last few sentences, because I don't know what my time is. I still have about two minutes. Um, can the EU uh, coherence uh, be achieved? That has been the discussion uh, going on since uh, it became clear that um, the European Union will eventually enlarge. Um, and um, there was this, um, there is this um, big issue of uh, applying the qualified majority voting as opposed to unanimity in selected areas of uh, of uh, voting on foreign policy issues. Um, and uh, yeah, it would probably make the European Union more actionable or um, more able to act and more flexible. Um, but um, it wouldn't um, solve the cases as, uh, you know, the, the photo shoot of, of Viktor Orban with, with Vladimir Putin. Uh, so um, in this sense, uh, achieving the EU unity is a much, much bigger task than, uh, than changing the treaties. This is not saying that changing the EU treaties at the moment isn't a huge task. Um, yeah, I guess that would be it for me for the moment, and uh, I will be happy to um, continue in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Pavlina. Then I'll uh, finally give the floor to Adil, move from the Free of Nonsense Institute. Yeah. Um, I'm happy to talk more about Russia if you want that, but it could be that uh, maybe in the questions. Uh, I would like to continue a little bit on this uh, issue about the coherence and the understanding of um, EU <coughs> energy import policies or energy import policies of EU countries to be more, uh, be more um, uh, correct. Uh, because uh, <coughs> energy policy, energy supply purchase is not the prerogative of the, the EU. This is <coughs> definitely a country responsibility. And uh, it is important to, to understand the, the policies of different uh, countries also, the energy policies of each uh, country on, on its own merits. Uh, I think uh, Paulina gave already some interesting insights into, into Hungary. 
uh, countries have different policies in this area, and then there are different reasons in different countries. And one of the reasons is uh, foreign policy orientation. I mean, there's absolutely no doubt that there is a link in that uh, area, and uh, Hungary is, of course, the best, uh, best case, that due to uh, the Hungarian government's uh, sort of um, inclination to, to, to understand and, and support Russia, it, it has implications for its choice of, um, of energy uh, supplies. But it's not the only, it's, it's not the only factor. Uh, all countries have different situations with regard to, to supply situation. And some countries have more choices or are more, uh, have more choices, others are more vulnerable. So again, back to you, uh, Martin. If, you, if you're going to sort of look at the position of countries, you have to take into account the specific situation. And take Hungary. Hungary is uh, probably the country in, in, uh, in Europe which is most dependent on Russian gas in its total energy supply, not only gas, but total energy supply situation. It stands out, in fact. It is also an important reason. But it, again, it can't, it can't uh, disregard the, 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 the foreign policy orientation. But you need to go more, uh, more um, mm, directly into the situation of, of each country. What are their options? Uh, in the case of Hungary, maybe they have other options they could have pursued if they didn't have this inclination to look to Russia. But um, in other cases, uh, countries may not have that many options. And as I said, energy security is a legitimate concern for any, any government. Uh, talking about this in the EU context, uh, one could ask why has it not been possible to introduce a common energy supply policy? Well, uh, partly this is, of course, a big uh, diplomatic uh, challenge to, to find common ground because countries are different. But seen sort of from the outside and the more sort of more principle level, it would seem that uh, all countries would enjoy benefits from a sort of a coordinated energy policy, energy supply policy, and which would include the sort of solidarity between the various members of the EU. Uh, well, this is uh, partly what you could call a collective action problem. Everybody sees the sort of potential for benefit from coordination, but on an individual level, they prefer to act unilaterally. Uh, and the, in terms of energy supplies, this means that many, most countries see an advantage for themselves in dealing with individual suppliers of gas, for instance. In the case, it could also be the case with, with Russian gas. You have individual advantages, even if you, in a way, would benefit if everybody had a concerted policy. So this is a, this is a big uh, big challenge in the, in the EU. Something has happened, though. In, in principle, uh, the EU has a solidarity principle when it comes to energy and supply reg regulations. And the uh, member states have sort of, in principle, signed up to the mm, commitment to, to that they are obliged to help fellow members experience since an energy crisis. If there's an energy supply crisis, other states should, uh, should support uh, the, the country that has an energy crisis. Uh, should pay for the service coming from other states. But so in general, you have a commitment here. But this has never happened in practice. It has never been used or introduced to concrete mechanisms to carry out this, um, uh, this solidarity. But still, something has, has changed since the invasion of the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine. Uh, right after the invasion, the plan the Repower EU was uh, introduced where um, one of the features was 
to, to reduce voluntarily gas consumption, to, to save on gas by 15% throughout the EU. And uh, difficult negotiations followed between um, EU, st EU states to, to, to do that. So partly successful uh, exercise. Uh, some concrete cooperation were also, was also achieved in terms of uh, coordination of gas storages. Gas storage is a very important uh, mechanism to even out uh, supply of, of, of gas. So, so this project or this ideal of, of coming to some sort of coordinated energy supply policy has been discussed and worked on especially since the invasion uh, last year. But uh, of course we are far away from a common policy of purchasing gas, which has been, pro uh, which has been uh, proposed by the way, sort of establishing a buyer consortia to get better deals, for instance from Norway. Um, one problem here is that this goes so much against the principles that has been ruling the EU uh, gas market policy now for a number of years, namely to make it uh, more market uh, oriented and avoid monopolies, both on the seller and the, and, and the purchaser side. But uh, in this new situation, the plan to coordinate, uh, uh, coordinate purchases have been on the table, like it was in the 1980s. Now, to complicate uh, things uh, further, uh, energy supplies from Russia is not is uh, is not the only only uh, challenge. All this happens at the same time as climate change and the required energy transition remains a top priority. And this interferes with the energy supply uh, concerns. Um, in this context, uh, because transiting away from hydrocarbons, of course, has implications for, for supplies. So you want to, EU wants, on the principal level, to secure alternative supplies with Russia, minimi minimizing supplies from Russia. But at the same time, there is a, this policy to, uh, for energy transition. And um, a very important development, uh, very recent development, um, is uh, the EU recommendation to to, to prohibit uh, long-term gas supply contracts beyond 2049. Uh, as one of the measures to, to force through uh, energy uh, transition, finding other uh, energy sources. But it is also, this can be also be a problem for securing uh, gas uh, supplies in the, in the medium term. I'm not speaking this as a, as a representative of Norwegian gas suppliers, don't uh, misunderstand me, but, but there, is a, there, is a, there is a tension between the goals of, uh, of energy transition and the need to secure supplies. Uh, and uh, the, the point is that some of the alternative supplies, taking in the Norwegian uh, continental, they, they, this is a very long-term investments, big, big, big long-term investments. So the companies need some security down the road to be able to, to invest. And if the policy is to sort of deny long-term commitments, it may be difficult to to get the necessary investments in the medium term. It's not, there are other factors here. I mean, we, about sort of political commitments and there, there are many, many other issues, but, but there, uh, which is make, uh, make this uh, issue a little bit more complicated, but I'm just saying that it, it is also a component in this overall picture of energy uh, supply. Uh, lastly, uh, just to link up to the discussion in the first uh, panel, maybe this uh, particular issue with, uh, with Norwegian uh, gas supplies would have been easier to deal with if Norway had been a member of the EU, which it, which it, is, which it, it is not. Okay, I think I'll stop there. We can uh, go on with, with questions. Thank you.
Thank you very much from, for all the interesting perspectives from the panel. Uh, we now have around uh, 20 minutes time for uh, questions from the audience. I hope you enjoyed the, uh, the contributions from the panels. Um, so you, uh, you are more than uh, welcome to ask questions uh, and we will bring the microphone around. Um, yes, we can take the first question here. My question or my comment actually is uh, about uh, is, uh, what papers, uh, when it comes to coherency, the European Union has so far proved to be master of coherence uh, by the help of the European Court of Justice. They said, at least in the internal uh, level, they said the PES that they are a very coherent uh, institution or union. Uh, and uh, the, the Lisbon Treaty and, uh, and the Copenhagen criteria laid a solid foundation, the purpose of this union. Now, when it comes to external diplomacy, we all know that when it comes to diplomacy interest, plays a lot of, a lot of role uh, when it comes to interest and selfishness. So uh, I believe that uh, since European Union internally managed to prove how coherent they are in managing the affairs, it shouldn't be difficult to establish a better framework to handle the external issues uh, although I know also that they have exclusive uh, competence in most of the bilateral treaties that are common to the European Union. Since they have such competence, they should also uh, introduce a stronger framework to make this uh, problem that we are having with Russia or energy crisis or security defense crisis, it shouldn't be a big problem for them because the most difficult one, which was making sure that the integration, everybody that wants to be part of us does what we want, how we want it, that should be more problematic than now dealing with the external factor. All they need is establish a better framework according to what the Lisbon Treaty says and according to how they handle the, the Copenhagen uh, criteria, then things should go properly. But my issue is whenever things get to diplomacy, everybody fights for his selfish interest. And that is what is going to be problematic for the European Union. But they should be able to handle it the way they handle the, the the internal issues, then it, should, it shouldn't be a big problem at all. That's uh, my comment. Yeah, if I could then take it straight away from you. Um, uh, Pavlina, like you, you said in the beginning that um, that unity that was manifested externally, that this seems to be rather the exception. Um, to you, I would confirm, like my first initial PhD project was on European foreign policy back in 2007 or 8, when there was then essentially nothing to write about because the Eurozone crisis hit and the dream of having like a world actor has basically uh, vanished um, overnight. Uh, I would also say that the Russians must have been quite surprised that we were able to pass 11 sanction packages. I know that we could talk like the contents and how specific are they and how hard are they hitting, but I still think that uh, originally the Russians counted on European uh, incoherence rather than, rather than coherence. Um, I, uh, as somebody who also studies this course, it's, it would be really nice to see that European Union can uniformly and coherently stand up to its values, um, that there would be no intra-institutional bickering when Charles Michel and Ursula von der Leyen, when they traveled to Kyiv, 
that they wouldn't be sitting on the opposite ends of the train, but that they would be actually like supporting each other. And if you listen to some um, uh, comments from the European Parliament, uh, they are like reaching even further than, than what the Commission President would be saying. So like coherence would be uh, nice even in the non-hypocritical sense, but practice is much different. I think as uh, Professor Mur um, said uh, a little bit earlier, then there's the pragmatic thing of infrastructure. Uh, it would be super to have uh, a unified European Union's oil and gas embargo on Russia, but the pipelines don't change overnight and the exceptions are not only Czech Republic and Hungary, but also Slovakia, because their, their dependence is, is massive and you can't really change this overnight. So then the deeds actually don't quite conform to the, to the words. But the last thing that I would like to say perhaps is that politics is not out of the perfect. And I am aware of the controversy here when I would say here that politics is out, out of the out of the possible. And in the end, even though Hungary was leveraging um, foreign policy unity for its basically domestic goals of getting, like, leveraging grants from, um, uh, from the European Union's budget, uh, in the end we did have a sanction package and uh, we were able to, uh, to put it into practice. Um, I also think that Domestically, if you look at states, uh, the different political parties, they have different solutions, they have different positions. Some are hawks, others are doves on what needs to be done in foreign policy. But in the end, then there is one foreign minister who actually then says, okay, this is, this is what we are going to do. So um, I don't think that internal uh, like diversity of opinions is such a big deal after all. Uh, one of the slogans of the EU is unity in diversity. So the diversity, I think it's, uh, it's a value to, to have there. Um, and I am then curious how that, like in reaction to the enlargement process is going to go because the, the, the ideas of a reform of that framework that you're talking about, it's not keeping the Lisbon Treaty. Everybody has been tired of even negotiating the Lisbon Treaty and that's why we left it for what, 15 years. But a new idea is on the table. The French and the Germans, they are pushing for extending qualified majority voting uh, also into foreign policy areas. There was a study recently published by, I don't know, the 12th, that also is supporting um, extension of qualified majority voting into foreign policy. So as long as we can agree on this, and I'm not saying that it's going to be easy, but I think there is hope for like maintaining some coherence even into the future. So. That's my comment, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, before we return to the panel, there's room for uh, one more, more question and then I'll take yours afterwards. So we'll have three questions and then return to the panel. Um, hello. Um, my question is just going to be very simple. As the European Union and their partner at the initiator of this uh, war in Ukraine and Russia. So, because of this energy crisis, what are the diplomatic strategies the EU are applying to end this war? That's my question. Thank you. Anyone in the panel who want to start with either of the comments and questions? So I will try to be very brief. Uh, the first question about the rule of law, I think, I mean, this is, of course, a, a good and valid comment, and it's uh, the disadvantage of foreign policy as such. What the EU is good at is legislation, a regulatory state, as it's sometimes referred to, and thus also framing contracts, agreements with other parties long term. But this doesn't work when it comes to responding quickly. Then you need to act in a different way, which brings us to the question of the reforms. Qualified majority voting on security, some issues within the field of common foreign policy, security policy, it is being discussed. It will not completely solve the problem. It can be done without a treaty reform, though. So it could be done without a treaty reform, and it could be done quite quickly. But on the other hand, you have a question then that the mandate is weaker. Now you have consensual decision making, meaning when once a decision is taken, you actually have a strong mandate for that. Even if you might hear different 
rhetorics of different leaders, you have a strong mandate for that position. If you have a voting, you would have Mr. Orban rocking around and saying, I was against it from the beginning, I'm not a part of it, and you have a really weaker mandate. So it doesn't really solve the core problem here. Uh, but I could consider it, it might be a sensible uh, suggestion for some specific areas. We'll call for a longer, more detailed dis discussion. Uh, how to end the war? <laughs> that is the, the question I think everyone would, would be thinking of. Uh, the European Union is not a security provider per definition. So that is the enlargement to, of European Union to Ukraine uh, would be very useful for rebuilding the country, economics and so on, but wouldn't really solve the security issue. We discussed in the previous panel NATO, we referred to the impossibility of enlarging NATO during the ongoing conflict. Well, you can hear some divergent views on that, for instance, by former General Secretary, Mr. Anders Fug Rasmussen, who kind of considered a version of partly inclusion, but that is a, a longer discussion. I don't have a good answer uh, uh, <laughs> to that question. I will pass it on to who, uh, who wants to go next, Ariel. Yeah, I could comment on some of the issues brought up. Um, yes, I think we can be quite uh, uh, certain that uh, um, Russia was surprised about the coherence of the European uh, response. And of course, it's not EU is not responsible for the war. That's very grave misunderstanding. But in a way, the, the response was uh, surprising, and it, it is also, I think, tantamount to the more long-term uh, Russian understanding in, of the EU. Um, Russia has always sort of toned down the importance of the EU, preferring to deal uh, bilaterally with, with, with states. And uh, so it really had a big problem understanding what kind of animal the EU is. And now this animal uh, was able to, to, to give the response, certainly a big, big surprise. Um, it was also another thing that was very surprising uh, for uh, Russia was the, the um, ability of the European countries to to cope with the energy supply crisis uh, that emerged in the in, in the in the fall and, and winter, um, you could, uh, it was clearly a Russian uh, expectation, and this you could take from the mouth of Vladimir Putin that uh, there would be a serious social uh, problems uh, which would lead to, to uh, economic uh, crisis and, and, uh, and uh, political upheaval. He spelled that out uh, very clearly. So the expectations was that uh, this would also change um, uh, European positions on the sanctions and on the war in Ukraine. This did not happen. And, uh, and Europe performed much better than many observers had expected, not only Russians, but also in Europe itself. Of course, it had to do with uh, the way uh, the supply crisis was handled, but it also had to do with the fact that the winter was relatively mild, so the situation was as, as precarious as expected. But it was, again, showing that uh, the, 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 the system of uh, dealing with energy supplies were, was not as bad as one should have thought. And this also goes to the thing you mentioned about uh, pipelines. When, uh, after the two uh, um, energy or gas crises that uh, were caused by the, the conflict between Russia and Ukraine in 2006 and 2009, as part of the development of the uh, internal gas market, it was not only about changing the contract uh, situation into short-term contracts, but it also was about and, and demonopolization uh, and bundling, as we call it in the, in the market. But it was also about creation, creating a physically more integrated market by building so-called interconnectors. Between, so, so, so gas can in fact run in different uh, situations. It doesn't mean that every, every, all gas can go everywhere, but the situation is much better than it would have been, let's say, 20 years ago. Uh, there is today a physical basis for this sort of solidarity um, uh, mechanism that doesn't exist or doesn't hasn't been established. It, there is a physical basis for that today that wasn't before. It is possible to send gas. That's why also you know, Norway can 
indirectly send gas to Slovakia. Um, it is it is uh, it is it is a much more flexi flexible uh, system. Thank you. Thank you um, for the questions. Uh, first, uh, for the um, better for a better framework uh, for the foreign policy of the European Union to actually um, come about, um, the member states would uh, have to be open to give up their um, competences and their powers when it comes to their foreign policy. And I don't really see them doing that anytime soon. Um, obviously, what could also uh, help would be appointing uh, a strong person to for the position of the high representative and then f for the political leaders of the EU member states to actually let him or her uh, speak and uh, not, not speak uh, over that person. Uh, but um, sorry to be the skeptic here, but I don't really see that happening in the in the near future. Um, as for the yeah, just just a few points to the uh, infrastructure that uh, cannot be built from from day to day. Um, I agree, and I realize that that is a um, that is a fact. But um, I think here the rhetoric is the key, and the, um, that the fact that uh, from the Hungarian side, uh, what we have seen is um, refusal from the start and not really any suggestion or any commitment to try to um, improve the situation or to diversify um, the, the energy resources. Um, and uh, yes, I'm very much a fan of, of unity in diversity, uh, but I'm not sure that, that it can work when it comes to vital interests, uh, which I consider the relationship to Russia to be for the European Union. I think that the, differences on this can actually be detrimental for the for the European Union. Um, and uh, lastly, the diplomatic strategies of the EU to, to end the war. Um, here, I hate to be the skeptic again. Uh, I think, yes, the European Union has, uh, after, after the full-scale invasion of Russia to Ukraine, the European Union has managed uh, to do un uh, things that would be unimaginable. Uh, in um, a few years back, but um, from what the situation looks like now, um, I think that might not be enough and that we need to do even more. Thank you. Uh, Martin, you have some comments? Let me send the, pass the microphone. Just a, a little reminder for the gentlemen that ask questions here and it's related to the decision-making process of the EU diplomacy. As gentlemen ask about the strategy of the EU diplomacy, the question is how the EU diplomacy is shaping, who is influencing decision-making process, what is European Commission doing and what is the Joseph Borrow doing? So I think here we need some clarification how the strategy and how the EU diplomacy is going to develop in the future. And for that reason, I would recommend you to read Immanuel Kant. And he has a concept of motivation. The first one, the people are motivated by duty. The second one is the motivation by inclination. And this tells you, and this basically opens the whole Pandora box, how in the EU, diplomatic strategy is shaped. So this is the first thing. The second thing, I'm very thankful for all the comments for senior scholars about all the questions you had, because we see that the discussion has a meaning. But who is going to initiate this discussion? Will it come from the EU? Will it come from the member states? Will it come from the scholars, academics? And how this discussion is going to continue and who is going to ev sorry, evaluate the outputs, the outcomes of this discussion. So that's also the question, because we want to write papers that have some meaning and influence on the policy. And the last thing, when you think about the questions about the EU diplomacy, you have to consider that EU is a dynamic entity. As Metz pointed out, it's probably going to have more members. When we're going to take the majority decision-making process, do we know how the member states are going to react? What sort of contracts they're going to sign, for instance, in energy security or 
maybe different goods, right? So, so this, this paper or this idea opens more avenues for discussion, and we should be ready to participate in those discussions. Thank you, Martin. Uh, we have a couple of minutes left, and I know that the gentleman here, he had a question. You'll have to be a little bit brief because we're running out of time. Well, it's tough to be brief, but uh, try. Discussing energy uh, development or situation in the context of the Russian war on, uh, on Ukraine, I'm wondering why you don't mention at all that the energy situation of Europe has largely, long before uh, you know, the invasion, uh, has been largely crippled uh, the, the energy supply by, by the European policy itself. Look at the uh, uh, nuclear, you know, suicidal nuclear policy of Germany. Look at the fracking uh, you know, total ban on fracking in, in Europe, uh, absolutely irrational, uh, insane. Look at the permits. Simply, the, the whole energy sector in Europe is one of the most regulated industries or sectors in Europe. Isn't it, isn't it enough of 40 years of communism that we should know that central planning does not work? It will never work. Only freedom works, only f free market works. And what we see in Europe, it's, it's a total disaster of energy policy. And now we're asking, how do we strike a balance between so-called European values in you know, responding to evil empire of Russia? How do we strike the balance against the energy security? We have crippled ourselves by, by the energy policy of Europe for decades what we've been doing. Right? So this is, I'm trying to be short, I, would, I could speak hours about this, but uh, shouldn't we at least mention that this was one of the major factors that you know, Putin used to, 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 to uh, uh, well, let's say, really go forward, apart from other major factors like weak US president and so forth. This was a major factor using the energy disaster of Europe uh, a, a, as a leverage that, that they used to, to, to uh, you know, go full scale with the invasion. Thank you. Any final comments from the panel? Aril? Yeah, um, no, it, it is, uh, of course, in retrospect, uh, uh, policies uh, uh, are can be absolutely questions, uh, I, I agree with you. And uh, as you well know, um, the policy areas you, you mentioned, uh, you know, they had their own, uh, their own reasoning, but they, but they indirectly, um, uh, for instance, the nuclear uh, ban in Germany, uh, you may also say the fracking uh, regulations and so on, they indirectly, they, um, uh, favored uh, increased reliance on Russian uh, gas uh, imports. So uh, I think it's it's not uh, extremely controversial uh, uh, to say today that uh, things should have been and could have been done differently. But it, this is, of course, goes back to the whole uh, understanding of, of Russia and uh, uh, not least in, in Germany, the belief that in integration through trade would stabilize the situation and be a bonus for uh, security. Well, that was a wrong uh, assumption. Um, the rise of Russian gas in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in Europe's supply was something that was, has much longer history and these more recent, uh, uh, recent uh, developments. And um, sort of a uh, little bit uh, unexpectedly, uh, Russian gas also had uh, uh, benefits from the policies that were introduced to make the market uh, more open and flexible, the, the, the integrated uh, gas markets I mentioned earlier. Uh, 
part of the policy uh, was, in fact, to try to to limit Russian uh, gas by making other uh, suppliers uh, more um, uh, accessible. And also, uh, it was an, a goal to, to construct uh, infrastructure that would make um, Europe less uh, vulnerable in the case of, uh, of cutoffs in uh, uh, Russian gas supplies. Now it turned out that the Russian gas sellers were able to offer in this more uh, sort of deregulated market gas at very competitive prices. So uh, even if the prices went down all over across the board, uh, Russian gas was very uh, competitive. And we saw that after 2014, despite the declarations about the need to reduce dependence on Russian gas, in fact, Russian gas exports increased. So that says also something about the, uh, sort of the, the relationship between political goals and the forces uh, of the market. In retrospect, uh, it's, it's very clear that um, efficient policies to, to reduce um, Russian gas uh, imports to Europe were not introduced, but partly because they were not possible in the new decentralized market-based um, system that was uh, uh, favored uh, in, the, in, in the EU. Uh, how big uh, importance the issues, in particular mentioned nuclear, and fracking, how much it means in terms of actual um, increased gas dependence can, can be discussed. But it clearly did not, uh, did not help uh, reducing the reliance on, on Russian gas. And we can agree on that. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we have to wrap it up here now. Uh, big round of applause to the panel. Thank you for your contributions. Uh, and also, <laughs> on behalf of the Fritz Nansen Institute, I would also like to thank uh, for the collaboration with Metropolitan University of Prague for this uh, collaborative effort. Uh, and I believe you will have some closing remarks as well. Thank you, Mats. I, I don't have any closing remarks. I would just like to thank very much Fritz Nansen Institute and Paul and Ariel for coming here from Oslo to join us here today. Thank you very much for that. Also mention a thank you to uh, EA Norway grants uh, for supporting this event and to the Norwegian Embassy for, for also their support. So, and thank you very much for coming as well. Thank you. And thanks to Palvina for coming all the way from Prague 10. And to